2022, and this is pre-meeting for March 28, 2022. Um, I know we had some questions from council for the meeting, so Councilor Simmons. Yes, thank you. Um, can I just go ahead and also do my update real quick? Uh, so last week I met with the election commission last Wednesday. Um, and it was just a formality just to meet with the group and to uh, discuss upcoming uh, items, which there's nothing this year. Um, so there's they're put on notice that there may or may not be a meeting, but um, because Westminster doesn't have an election until next year. So uh, their their role and their activities will ramp up next year. But um, it was just a quick meeting just to touch base with the group. But uh, moving on to the question for tonight. One of them I had was for the contract with TerraCare Associates. Uh, that for I just wanted to know if it would be build in lump sum or build upon service. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, John Burke will be coming up to the table here in a moment. Councillor Edmonds, John Burke at downtown Westminster. Great question. So it is not a, a lump sum contract. It's actually time materials. So we when we sent out the RFP, it was for a baseline contract for streetscape, pet waste removal, things like that. So it's all time materials. And then all the store removal was on top of that. Okay, so it's just up to a certain amount, right? Mass not to see, so we don't spend it on the maintenance, we keep that money. Sure, okay. I know some contracts are set up, because I looked through the contracts, some contracts are set up in on some payments, and then they capitalize on whatever's not, right? So I just wanted to ensure that that was um, built upon service. And then the other question is that we compared in that same item, we compared Park Meadows and Southwest Plaza to the Orchard and the downtown. And I'm just wondering why we chose those areas instead of closer entities. No, great question. Again, that was solely based upon the fact we actually knew the consultants that worked on those contracts and were able to easily get that data. So if council wanted, we can go back and try to find other locations. We did include the Orchard Town Center and that was a lump sum contract or is uh, for $450,000 a year for snow removal. Even that, if there's a snowstorm that's over 18 inches, that's on a time materials basis. So that is a contract where if the vendor, <laughs> there's not much snow, they actually make money per se, but if there's more snow, then they, they lose money on that. So again, we are trying to get a baseline for other comparison sites that were of decent uh, proximity, but also of size. Okay, perfect. I just didn't know, because we usually stick within our geographical area. So it was just kind of odd to see South yeah, <laughs> entities. So, all right, that. thank you. Yep. I saw a bunch of questions. You want to wait till 10 yeah, comes to us? Ask them. Okay. Anybody so, else have anything? I do have the one question. Uh, on the uh, contracts with the Semper Rehabilitation and the alternate site, it gave a price for the Semper Rehabilitation, but it didn't give a price for the alternate sites. Uh, thank you. Stephanie will join us from Public Works Utilities. She can talk about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we do have a rehab um, amendment that is being addressed right now with the consultant for the Semper site. Alternate sites we're going to address in an eighth amendment, and we're negotiating that right now. With them. So that'll be following just immediately after, and they're well aware of that work. So when we when we met we with the done anything? No, when we met with the consultant, what they really needed to start on right away was the Semper uh, alternatives. Those were the more complex uh, analyses and different because we had abandoned that work much earlier in the process. So they we didn't want to lose any time and wait to negotiate what Stephanie described as the Eighth Amendment. So the consultant's working furiously on the Semper alternatives. And we will bring in the Eighth Amendment to that contract at the right time for them to commence the alternative uh, the alternative investigations non semper if that makes sense. I was just disappointed. I thought we were working both of them as fast as we could. But they will be. So they, this work, the consultant has, has got all of its resources that it can bear on the semper alternatives right now. And this work will come in at the right time for them. Um, to continue the work, if that makes sense. There's a pacing issue for them as well. Th this made sense um, for the consultant team. That's right. I mean, they're fully booked on Semper by itself yeah. in this moment. Councilor Mayor Is that, if I heard you right, that's because 
because of what it is. And there was certain work at some point in this whole scheme of replacing or retrofitting a water plant that they had some of that work already done. So that kind of gave them a jump off point. Do I understand that right? I'm not sure. Okay, tell me if I heard you right. They they really need to dig into the Semper site itself right now. They need to investigate the site. That's what they're doing. In fact, they're doing it this week. Um, and Semper alone. Alternate sites, that will get into an expansion alternative or alternate alternative adjacent sites. So that's that's a sort of follow on effort. But it's not, there's no real pause. <laughs> they're just, they're working on one thing right now and they have so many people that they can have working on it. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that makes sense. Really I just it. thought if when you first started explaining, it sounded like maybe they already had a lot more detail on that one. So that was prioritized because of that, because they're already kind of naturally further along and being able to analyze it and move forward. Whereas with an alternate plant, that's all fresh and there's not as much as that. Did I hear that right? There's Maybe I missed There's certainly some truth to that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the, the other way to look at it also is they're starting with the core site, which is the contained December campus, mm -hmm. right? Which, uh, and, and then they're going to radiate out from that with their options to the broader uh, analyses, including adjacent property. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I just want to express my disappointment because there's no way to recapture the time. Okay, that it's just gone. But one of the goals I had is if one of the alternate sites, because we were really talking about 2025 on Westminster Boulevard, and integral to that is the condemnation proceeding we're involved in. And I had really hoped that these alternate sites could have put a dollar sign on what we're doing so we could have made a decision about whether to proceed with the condemnation. That time's lost, I just want to express my disappointment because when we did that back in the middle of February, I truly thought we were going to work on everything simultaneously. So, thank you. Anyone else? Questions for tonight? Anything else, Brett? Um, I will say this out there also, but I just want to say thank you to Acting City Manager Door during a time it was a full moon. <laughs> I knew Sunday night you had to be like a balloon just going. You can do your own job, <laughs> but you did. I, I mean, with everything you were involved with, stuff with me for what the council is doing with the search team. Um, after our long meeting last Monday night for the study session, I've never seen such jump into action. Every I don't even know all the people to think that jumped into action to help with what we heard and what we've been getting emails over. And I think Jody told me today we're down to one tent with two people um, and they're working with them. And the statistics prove out that if we're able to get them housed someplace else, they're not just going to be coming back. And so there's that balance piece. Um, but you worked from, I don't know if you did sleep that night, but you were on site <laughs> the next morning. You were on site um, several times. And I just want to say from city council, thank you to all of you. I know Parks and Rec were involved. I know Kate was and the navigator. Um, to me, you moved some mountains that I, I just haven't seen before. So thanks. Thank you. Great team behind all of us making all that work go. But we appreciate the recognition. Thank you. And I hope you were able to enjoy your vacation knowing <laughs> you were in good hands. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doerr, <laughs> and thank you, Council, for supporting last week for me to be away. It was a full moon week. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Catching up on it today. <laughs> uh, I know Councilor Nomella did when her telephone told us how many emails she had. <laughs> it was sort of like, oh, okay. tired before you ever got started. Um, we have a thank you. Instead of sending it around, I'm just going to say it's from Front Range Community College Foundation. They're thanking us for the money um, 
to their annual high need program fund, both the dedication to Front Ridge Community College students and the contribution um, are greatly appreciated. Sincerely, Marley Marsh, FRCC Foundation board member. So they thank us for that. There's nothing else we can go out in the other room and say hi to all of our people getting awards tonight. Goodness. Good night. Oh, one thing quickly. Oh. Did you update the mayor? I'll be doing the yes. 20 year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Go forth.
Welcome to tonight's meeting of uh, March 28, 2022. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Present. Councillor Emmons. Present. Councillor Azadi. Here. Mayor McNally. Here. And Councillor Nermella. Here. And Councillor Seymour. Here. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the March 14th meeting? Mayor Pro Tem? I move to approve the minutes of the March 14th, 2022 meeting as presented. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of March 14th, 2022. Are there any further discussions? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Tonight's always a fun night when we have presentations and we have many tonight. So that makes us happy. The first one will be Councillor Azadi will present our proclamation to City Forester Brian McCoy um, for Arbor Day. You have to use your outside voice. Obi, I think your proclamation is on top. <laughs> Hello, testing. Oh, hey, all right, all right. <laughs> this gives a ledge, so this is nice. <laughs> Brian McCoy, welcome. So tonight I'm I'm stating a proclamation declaring Arbor Day on April 15th. I'm, I'm gonna read this here. So whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day called Arbor Day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas the holiday called Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees and can, can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas and beautify our community, and whereas Westminster has been recognized as a tree city USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation and desires to continue its tree planting ways. Now, therefore, I, Nancy McNally, mayor of the city of Westminster, on behalf of the entire city council and staff, do hereby proclaim Friday, April 15th, 2022, as Arbor Day in the city of Westminster and call upon the people of Westminster to support efforts to protect our trees, to support our city's urban forestry program, and further urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the hearts and promote the well-being of present and future generations. And they need a photo op, Councillor Izadi. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Emmons to present a proclamation to the Victim Services Coordinator and staff proclaiming the month of April uh, 2022 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the City of Westminster. All right, so up here I have uh, Ms. Drew Hogan and Edna Hendershot, thank you. Uh, and they uh, work with our police department for victim services um, in our city. And I just wanted to read a little bit of the back, background information um, in our report because I think it's prudent uh, and helpful to understand why we're doing this. But in April 2021, the 2001, excuse me, <laughs> in April 2001, the United States nationally observed Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Compassionate, courageous, and dedicated individuals, local organizations, and other partners have provided services and support for victims and survivors and worked to prevent sexual violence for decades. This recognition is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and impacts every community member in the city of Westminster. The City of Westminster strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and of every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts to prevent sexual violence. Proclaiming April 2022 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month supports the City's strategic plan goal to foster and maintain a beautiful, desirable, and safe, environmentally responsible city. So I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what the program does and what you each do for uh, for uh, victims. Um, I'm an advocate as well, so I know and understand how much it can affect the mind, body, and soul just of yourself, um, including the victims. So thank you and your peers on what you do. Yes, is there anything that you would like to say before I read the proclamation? Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the council um, and everyone that's here in recognizing the victims and survivors and the family and friends um, during this important month, all throughout the year, I think it's um, really courageous of you all to stand up for um, the people that don't have people standing up for them all the time. And um, Drew Hogan is our victim services coordinator and her and her volunteers and staff members, professional staff members do incredible work for the police department and throughout the city. So um, as part of this recognition, I'd like to um, recognize Drew and her team's efforts as well. Thank you, Council. <laughs> All right, whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and impacts every community member in the city of Westminster. And whereas rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment impacts citizens of Westminster regardless of age, race or gender, and whereas we must work together to educate our community about sexual violence prevention, supporting survivors and speaking out against harmful attitudes and actions. And whereas with leadership, dedication and encouragement, there is compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence in Westminster through prevention, education, increased awareness and holding per, uh, perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. And whereas the Westminster Police Department, as a member of the 17th Judicial Sexual Assault Response Team, remains committed to responding to sexual violence with a victim-centered, offender-focused approach. And whereas the City of Westminster strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners, and of every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address sexual violence. Now, therefore, I, Nancy McNally, Mayor of the City of Westminster, on behalf of the entire City Council and staff, do hereby proclaim the month of April 20. 22 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and call upon the people of Westminster to join in honoring the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and its citizens safe. Signed this 28th day of March 2022.
And I just want to give a shout out to Councillor Emmons. She's a CASA advocate, and I know she'd love to talk to anybody if you have some extra time and what it means. Um, she pours her heart into that, and I love listening to her CASA stories. So thank you. That brings us to Councillor Numella is going to present the Persian uh, New Year Proclamation. Can you hear me? <laughs> right. Nishin, if you want to come on up, join me. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to just um, help celebrate the Persian New Year. This is just representative of our many different uh, cultures and experiences that we have in our community. And so it's always a pleasure to be able to celebrate um, with our community and I don't, did you want to say something, Eugene? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so I'm here to raise awareness for Nowruz, and thank you so much for the proclamation. Um, Nowruz is probably one of the world's few non-religious holidays. It's very inclusive because of that, because all it celebrates is nature and its renewal. So it's all about reconciliation. It's about rebirth, regrowth. It's about peace. It's about being together with friends and family. It's about getting rid of what doesn't serve you to take into the future. Uh, so it's just a, an overall happy, joyous celebration that we've been celebrating for thousands of years. And there are a lot of Iranian Americans in diaspora who celebrated Tajiks, uh, people from Afghanistan, Tajikis, or Uzbekistan, uh, a lot of various regions from Central and uh, Eastern Western Asia celebrate this holiday. So a wonderful, happy Noruz to all of you. Noruz Piruz. <laughs> I'm going to read the proclamation. Uh, so, whereas citizens of Westminster, Colorado, recognize the celebration of Noruz, marking the Persian New Year, and whereas the cultural celebration of Noruz promotes inclusivity and social and environmental justice, as it reminds all people who celebrate to speak, act, and do positive deeds for their community, contributing to the world regardless of ethnicity, ideology, or lifestyle. And whereas on March 20th, 2022, the city of Westminster recognized the Iranian American community in celebration of Nauruz, marking new beginnings for people as nature renews itself and all set intentions for love health, abundance, beauty, reflection, growth, and enlightenment, and connect the Iranian community and the community at large. Now, therefore, I, Nancy McNally, Mayor of the City of Westminster, Colorado, on behalf of the entire City Council and staff, do hereby proclaim March 20th, 2022, Nauruz Day, in the City of Westminster, and call upon all citizens and civic organizations to join me in recognizing this momentous occasion in the Persian community. Give me the microphone and you can hold. Yeah. Next, we're going to start always the most fun part of saying thank you to our employees of 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40 years. And unfortunately, some of those people ditched us tonight. So I don't know. And um, I hope when your name's called, if you are here, your family members will come up with you because they are as much a part of your giving here as you are. So please bring them up 
introduce them and let us say thank you to them too. Mr. Seymour, you or Councillor Seymour, you have the 20 year certificate. I, I touched, okay. I touched a button. I thought it was me. Uh, <laughs> Nolan Bailey, please come forward. Family, friends, acquaintances. Pets. Pets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you introduce your fiance, please? Very good. Um, Nolan Bailey, 20 years of service, was hired as Westminster Fire Department in 20, 2002 as an entry level fire. Yeah, you came up fast. <laughs> entry level firefighter in 2004. Nolan completed paramedic school cycle 75 at St. Anthony's Hospital and was promoted to the position of fire paramedic. In 2012, Nolan received the Westminster Fire Department's Life Saving Award for his crew's successful resuscitation of a citizen in cardiac arrest. He's also a member of the Fire Department's Water Dive Rescue Team and for eight years and was promoted to his current position as Fire Lieutenant in 2017. When promoted to Lieutenant, he was assigned to the Department's Training Division and Field Training Officer from 2017 to 2019. In his position, he was responsible for several training duties, including creating and coordinating department-wide live fire training evolutions, assistance with developing professional qualification manuals and fire certification management for all Westminster firefighters. In his time as field training officer, he attended the FDIC Fire Department Instruction Conference, not the Federal Insurance Corporation. Okay, different one. In Indianapolis, Indiana, this one sounds better. Each year, attendance in the conferences allowed the Westminster Training Division to gain knowledge, training, equipment, and skills that were provided to Westminster firefighters today. Since 2020, Nolan has been assigned as online fire lieutenant, engine two, B-shift. He's currently serving as a provisional role as B-shift safety and medical officer, SAM-1. Prior to promoting to fire lieutenant, Nolan completed the managing officer program at the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Completion of the program required two years of travel for on-campus classroom training and a completion of a capstone project. Nolan's project selection was the development of a high school vocational program for students. It's a big one. <laughs> this, this is the big one for area students. Of high school vocational program for students that are interested in fire service. This program was accepted at the Adams County School District 12 and its addition to Bowman Technology and Vocational Program. The program is in its second year and is providing students with a future forward facility in Thornton, Colorado. Uh, Nolan has a stepson, Marcus, 16, two children, Leslie, 19, Bryson, 15, and they also have a two year old Newfoundland, Bodie. Bodie. <laughs> Pronounced Bodie. Yeah. Fourth kid. Yep, that's true. Um, Nolan lives with his fiance, Cara, in Broomfield. They enjoyed traveling Colorado, vacationing, outdoor activities, hiking, paddle boarding, and Nolan's hobbies, including home upgrade projects. Yeah, I'll bet. Time with friends, and he is looking forward to restoring a mini truck in the near future. Um, congratulations on 20 years of service, and thank you very much for your service to the city. Next up, he was sitting behind me, he moved. Next up, Eric Burke. The whole clan came. And clan. If I'm going to give you the mic and let you introduce everyone. Hello, this is uh, my son, Gage, my wife, Eileen, my son, Logan. <laughs> Welcome. You guys are ready for this, right? All right. Prior to joining the Westminster Fire Department, Eric worked as a seasonal employee for Parks Rex and Library. He was hired as a firefighter March 2002 and currently serves as Deputy Fire Chief of Operations. During his tenure with the Fire Department, he's held multiple positions and served on numerous committees and special teams, including the Technical Rescue Team, the Employee Advisory Committee, Citywide Safety Committee, the Accreditation Team, and the Chaplain Program. Eric was the valedictorian of St. Anthony's Hospital Paramedic Academy 
And while serving as a paramedic, paramedic he received a life-saving award following the resuscitation of a cardiac arrest patient. One of Eric's many accomplishments was developing the organization's first safety and medical officer position. Eric is currently a lead for Westminster's collective bargaining team and has served in that capacity since 2017. Over the past two years, Eric's work has largely been focused on pandemic response. Those duties include developing internal health and safety protocols for the organization and securing pandemic related services, such as testing and vaccines for the community and employees. Eric has a bachelor's degree for the University of Northern Colorado, go Bears, and a graduate <laughs> of the University of Denver Public Safety Leadership Program, as well as the National Fire Academy's Executive Fire Officer Program. Eric enjoys spending time with his family. He's been married to his wife, Eileen, for 13 years, Logan and Gage, and Eric is an avid sports fan, enjoys traveling and spending time outdoors. And a congratulations and thank you for your 20 years of service. <laughs> A quick side note, one of the members that could not be here tonight He's going to get fined for some reason, but um, we'll, we'll figure that out when we track him down. He's probably on a control on, on a, on a uh, call out, but um, I want to recognize 20 years of service for um, a patrol watch commander and SWAT commander, Trevor Matarasso. So when you see Trevor, give him a hearty hello. <laughs> and tell him he owes people. <laughs> no show. <laughs> Debbie Schofield, please. And entourage. <laughs> I said I would take the mic tonight. So um, I have my family with me, my parents, um, Jim from Two Down, and my brother David. And uh, my one guy, Gage. I'm so excited. I can't stand it. <laughs> my daughter in law, Judy, we call her Rolly. <laughs> Thank you. Deborah Debbie Schofield started February 19, 2002 as a part-time accounts payable technician. In 2007, Debbie moved on to the full-time AP technician position. Debbie previously worked in, an, in accounting for a private sector firm, primarily for engineers for 20 years. That, that'll tax you. <laughs> Before coming to the city of Westminster, accounts payable is her favorite part of accounting. Debbie loves interacting with both the internal and external customers. She has seen many challenges in the industry and the city itself. Most recently, finance implemented a paperless invoice process as well as the employee reimbursement and travel reimbursement process. A goal of the finance department has been aiming for and COVID-19 forced their hand. Debbie's father was in the Navy. Thank you, appreciate it. Growing up, Debbie had the privilege of living many places. Debbie chose to settle with growing, grow her roots here in Colorado and has been here since 1983. Almost made it. She is married with two grown sons and one granddaughter that live nearby. Debbie is a believer in being good to our world's environment. She is a passionate gardener, both indoors and outdoors. Her front yard is now zero scaped rock garden filled with dozens of types of flowers and vegetables. And for your outstanding 20 years of service, we thank you very much. even got flowers how nice 
Well, next we're going to do 25 years, and that comes with something special, and we'll talk about that when we give it away. But Robert Kuchkin, are you here? And Entourage? No, they all sitting down. What's that about? <laughs> Come on in. Bob joined the city in, on March 3rd, 1997 as an electronic, elect, electro mechanic specialist at the Big Dry Creek Water Wastewater Treatment Facility. Since then, his position has evolved into foreman in 2013 and ended into plant maintenance supervisor in 2021. In these positions, he was responsible for the diagnosis, repair, and maintenance of equipment and controls at Big Dry Creek Wastewater Facility and reclaimed water treatment facility along with reclaimed distribution vaults throughout the city. He has been involved with numerous expansions and projects and major equipment and replacements at the facilities during this time. Some of these include the Big Dry Creek plant upgrade in 1997, the design and construction of the reclaimed water treatment facility in 2000, the design and construction of Big Dry Creek expansion project in 2007, the expansion of the reclaimed water treatment facility in 2012, and the design and construction of the new dewatering facility, which was completed last year. Before coming to the city, Bob completed two apprenticeships with the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad and studied electronics at Front Range Community College. He is a journeyman, single man, and railway car man, and has worked as signal traction power maintainer for light rail, and I'm glad I don't have to say that 10 times, in Denver. Bob also worked at the General Cable Manufacturing Facility in Westminster as a CNC machine tool technician. Bob enjoys spending time with his family along with outdoor activities such as hiking, bicycling, auto racing, and riding his Harley. Well, we have not only a pin and plaque for you, but we have a check. Art Ray. Welcome. So with me tonight, I have my best friend, my wife of 37 years. We have our uh, two sons with us, Arthur and Christopher. Both of them have worked at the city for a while themselves. Welcome. Art Ray was hired in 1997 as a program programmer, programmer analyst too for the information technology department and then became lead software engineer in 2000. He moved up to the software engineer manager in 2007. As a manager, he leads a team of 15 highly skilled software engineers handling the applications and databases for the major software systems in the city and has become a significant member of the information technology management team. He loves, loves to spend time with his family, his wife, Mary Lou of 37 years, their five children, one son-in-law and a grandson. He also enjoys the great outdoors where he spends his time fishing, camping, hiking and hunting. Stephanie Shaver.
My husband Bob, my son Tim, my daughter Nicole, my grandson Leo, and Stephanie Shaver was hired in 1997 as a communication specialist in the Public Safety Center. In addition to her core responsibilities, Stephanie has served as a trainer, a member of the peer team support, and a member of the SWAT dispatch team. Throughout her career, Stephanie has been an integral part of numerous critical incidents and major events. She has been recognized with the following team awards. 2001, outstanding teamwork during a critical incident. 2006, training a record eight new employees at once to increase our staffing 50%. 2007, excellence in action during the blizzard of 2006. 2010, robbery shooting on November 19, 2009. 2013, outstanding teamwork contributing to Justice for Jessica, October 5, 2012. And 2017, exceptional calm and skill during officer-involved shooting guitar, at the Guitar Center. In addition to these accolades, Stephanie received the Meritorious Service Award in 2014 for her role in Westminster's assistance during the Nevada hostage situation. Stephanie enjoys spending time with her husband, son, daughter, and her two wonderful friends. Thank you. Could I get Stephen McDonald to join me up front? Any guests you might have with you? Okay, this is my lovely wife, Mary, and my four kids and six grandkids couldn't be with me tonight, but they say hi. Well, uh, Stephen McDonald was hired as a police officer on January 1st, 1982, and retired as a police sergeant on January 1st, 2018. He continued his employment with the city and the police department assigned as a civilian security guard at the Westminster Municipal Courts, and eventually transferred to the Equipment Services Tech at the police department, where he is currently assigned. While serving as a commissioned officer with the police department, he has achieved the status of police officer to senior police officer to master police officer and eventually was promoted to the rank of sergeant. During his tenure with the police or with the department, he held several different positions to include investigator and professional standards unit, detective and investigation unit, and served as an officer in the traffic unit as well as being the patrol. Uh, Steve was the field training instructor, a CPR instructor, a level two accident reconstructive and emergency vehicle operations instructor, Steve uh, was an investigator for the North Metro Accident Investigation Team, a bond commission for Jefferson County, and has served as vice president on the Colorado Public Information Officers Association. He was awarded Officer of the Year by the Westminster Optimist Club in 1989. Steve is grateful and proud to be an employee of Westminster Police Department in the city of Westminster for the past 40 years. We're pleased and proud that we had you. Thank you. Quickly, I'll, I'll have to say, you feel very unaccomplished when we go through these numbers because you all do so much for the city. I mean, look at the, the different things that, that you've heard tonight has went through. A lot of people started here and like that. So I always think that's pretty impressive and worth pointing out. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you again to everybody that received awards tonight and to your families. It is okay to get up and go now and you don't have to sit through our long meeting. Um, but Councillor Emmons reminded me that last week was the year anniversary of the shooting in Boulder at King Supers. And so let's just take a minute for some silence. Um, we just said thanks to so many of the police and fire here that are always on those scenes. And so it seems appropriate that we just take a moment to remember those that helped and those that lost people um, a year ago. Thank you. We now have a special presentation. Um, interim City Manager Jody Andrews, are you going to introduce? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to ask our uh, two deputies uh, from our fire department to come up to the uh, podium tonight and present to us on the Marshall Fire. Most people may not know in Westminster that our, our uh, fire department um, was a major player in the response to that uh, Marshall Fire. It was a very extensive uh, incident and um, our department played a key role along with uh, many of our neighboring communities. And so uh, deputies Burke and deputies Hose will be uh, presenting tonight on uh, that fire and our role in it as well. I've heard this presentation and it, it's amazing and I'm glad it's going to be on YouTube so we can tell friends to watch um, what you describe is brings chills to us. And I'm sorry, it's on a night you should be going home with your family. That's okay. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, my name is Eric Burke. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for the Westminster Fire Department. The intent of our presentation today is to provide an overview of our response to the Marshall Fire. And in addition, the steps that were taken to ensure that we had emergency response coverage in the City of Westminster. In addition, we do cover some of our actions that we have taken that we um, undertook after the event and, and things that we're looking forward to help prepare for future type events. Um, I, I would like to, I think I'm going to do my slides. So I'll go next slide here and then highlight that we all know the devastating impact of the Marshall Fire. We all are familiar of the events of December 30, 2021 and the impact on our region. Um, the NCAR fire that just occurred over this weekend also brought to attention you know, the threat of fire is, is year round and that we have uh, these events and we have to be prepared as a community. I would like to take a moment to highlight just briefly some of our response to the NCAR fire, as well as some things that may have been a, a difference contributed to the difference in the impact and the scope of those two fires. Uh, the Westminster Fire Department on Saturday did respond um, to the NCAR fire to provide assistance in Boulder. We responded with uh, one individual who served as a team leader who could oversee multiple engine companies from a variety of agencies. And we sent Westminster Engine 5 to NCAR to assist. Uh, they were deployed in the afternoon, Saturday, approximately five or six o'clock, and they worked till about eight o'clock the next morning on Sunday before being relieved to coming uh, back to Westminster. Um, when we look at the difference between uh, the devastation of the Marshall Fire as well as NCAR, um, you know, there, there's one significant factor in my mind, and, and that is wind. Um, the Marshall Fire occurred on a day where we had winds that were registered as high as 150 miles per hour in one location. Now, we had, did have high winds on Saturday. However, they were not to the extent as we did on the um, Marshall Fire on December 30th. Um, so that the, those are some, that's a, a predominant factor is the wind. Um, the Marshall Fire, once that fire got into the neighborhoods, that creates a significant amount of fuel. And with that wind, you're blowing that heat and the burning materials across the neighborhood in that area. So the fire was passing from structure to structure to area to area. So again, the wind played a significant impact um, in the Marshall Fire. We did have wind at the NCAR event, but not quite to the same extent. A little bit different topography. And again, the fire at NCAR right now is all reports that did not involve any structures. 
So again, those are some of the things that differed and why um, the uh, devastation and the impact is different between those two events. All right, so next slide, please. Um, to highlight our response, I think it's important to give context to what our staffing model looks like. The Westminster Fire Department has a minimum staffing level of 33 personnel each day, and that provides for one battalion chief, one safety medical officer, two truck companies, five fire engines, um, and five medic units. And you note that it says ambulances next to medic units. A medic unit functions just like an ambulance in that it provides patient care and treatment and transports patients to the hospital. However, our personnel assigned to medic units are all trained in fire suppression. They have fire suppression equipment and they will engage in fire suppression activities when we need them to. So that's an advantage to our community and our operations to have that dual function in those providers. Um, I wanna highlight here the battalion chief and the role of the battalion chief. The battalion chief, uh, we have three battalion chiefs at the city of Westminster. We have three shifts, A, B, and C shift, all that work 48 hour shifts. Um, each shift has one battalion. That battalion is responsible for supervising that shift and all of the operations um, that occur on a daily basis. And if there's a significant event in Westminster, it's gonna be a Westminster Battalion Chief who will be serve as that incident command. And if there are any questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer them as we go along. Right. Next slide, please. At approximately 1.53 p.m., Westminster received a request uh, to respond to the Marshall Fire. That led to the deployment of Battalion 1, our Battalion Chief, Engine 3, and Engine 5. Those that are not familiar with our station location, engine, uh, engine three and engine five are located on the west side of our city. Our station five is 101st in Garland and station three is 90th in Wadsworth. And as I stated, our battalion chief is one who takes um, control of any incident that occurs in Westminster. So it's important for the fire department that anytime we have resources deployed outside the city, that we have a method for bringing in additional resources. And we constantly have that process in play. So once Battalion 1 and Engine 3 were deployed, um, we, Chief 2, which is Deputy Chief of Admin, Bob Hose, assumed Battalion Chief responsibilities for the city. So even though the battalion was responding to Marshall Fire, we had battalion coverage in Westminster. I highlighted that Engine 3 and Engine 5 are on the west side of the city. We relocated an engine from our Station 2 over to District 3, Station 3, so we had coverage, fire suppression coverage on that west side. Those are things that occurred within minutes of that deployment. Um, our battalion and battalion one, engine three, engine five, they were initially dispatched to provide assistance in evacuating a Vista hospital. Um, however, when they arrived at the Vista hospital, um, they were redirected to engage the fire that was in the neighborhood surrounding the hospital. And battalion one was actually assigned as a division supervisor, division alpha. And what that means is a division is a geographical area. And our battalion was responsible for the operations in that area and all of the resources that were, were there. So that could be Westminster and North Metro and a variety of other agencies um, that he would oversee that. Um, Battalion one, upon entering the neighborhood, provided an update back to Westminster that he had three fully involved homes. Within minutes, radio back that he had eight fully involved homes. So that this quickly tra um, transpired into a, a, you know, a neighborhood fire advancing home by home. And so he radioed back for additional resources and then we sent Westminster um, engine four to be our third engine um, in that initial response, engine three, engine five, engine four, battalion one. Um, Chief three, that is my call sign. And then our off-duty battalions carry a call sign as well. And so we have chief five and six. We held a conference call and determined that this was going to be a sustained operation in the Boulder County and that uh, significant resources were gonna be needed to support those operations as well as to ensure coverage for Westminster. So we initiate an emergency callback for off-duty personnel to come to Westminster to staff reserve units. I will take a moment to commend the firefighters of our organization, their dedication and commitment to the community. Before we had initiated that response, we were already receiving that, initiating that callback. We were receiving phone calls from our firefighters, letting um, us know that they're available to come to station, they're ready to put in service a reserve apparatus. So I would like to, to thank them for their service and dedication. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here is just a map that highlights um, Division Alpha, where our crews were initially located. Uh, that is right around the McCaslin Boulevard area. Next slide. 
Um, these slides depict some of the scenes that our crews uh, saw when they responded in these neighborhoods. As you can see, you know, blocks of homes on fire and just significant extensive fire before every entering the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Another picture just to pick the scene as they are responding. Next slide. So here I'd like to take a moment to, to show a little bit of the operations that were taking place, that were taking place that day. On the left picture, the picture on the left, um, it shows we have one home fully involved in fire and one that is not. We have a deck gun, which is a, a fire appliance on top of the engine, spraying water towards that uninvolved home. And it's trying to protect that home. We're trying to stop that fire. And also redirect that stream directly into the, the home that's on fire. That'll put out about a thousand gallons per minute out of that deck gun. And we have additional lines that are stretched that will flow um, a couple hundred gallons per minute. And again, the objective here was the firefighters would pick a point. There may be a row of homes that are on fire and row of homes that are uninvolved to pick a, a spot where they were going to defend and try and stop that fire to save rows of home. And they are successful in saving many homes um, during this uh, event. Um, on the right side, you will see a picture of an engine looking back up towards um, where there's a couple firefighters operating hose lines. And you can see uh, would be the furthest right of this picture that those rows of homes are all gone but they're trying to draw that line to stop that fire from advancing to these other homes. What's important here is that they are not, their engine is a ways away from where they're operating. The wind, as I talked about earlier, and, and how that fire quickly advanced, that they had to be in a position where if they need to quickly evacuate the area, they could. And so that's why they have that engine a far distance away. They'll pull the hose lines up the road, engage the fire, and then if they have to leave, they can. And in this case, there were many times where they had to rapidly exit the environment. Uh, disconnect their hoses, cut their hoses, and abandon those to get out of that environment. Next slide. All right, so um, I highlighted the emergency call back process to get additional personnel, but we work very closely with our surrounding jurisdictions and North Area Fire Departments. That The North Area Fire Departments include South Adams County Fire, Adams County Fire, Federal Heights Fire Department, North Metro Fire, Thornton Fire, Brighton Fire, and Westminster Fire. And so at 3 p.m., we are holding a video conference with the chiefs and operation chiefs of those various agencies to determine what resources had been committed to the Marshall Fire, what resources were available locally, and what were the efforts to call back emergency personnel. And those efforts were being coordinated to ensure that we could continue to sustain and support the operations in, in Boulder County, but ensure coverage in our local municipalities. As you can see here, there highlights the, the response personnel or the off-duty personnel that came in, what resources they were able to staff and put in service to provide coverage for Westminster. Two engine companies, a medic unit, a wildland brush truck, and two additional battalions. Um, all these resources were in place before any additional responses into Boulder. And next slide, please. At 6 p.m., um, Westminster Police and Fire Dispatch received a second request to respond, and that led to the deployment of Engine 1, Engine 2, and one of the off-duty battalion chiefs who came in to support the city, so Battalion 5, then deployed out. Again, I said it's very important that we have a battalion chief in the city, Battalion 6, who also came in from off-duty, assumed that responsibility for the city. Uh, next slide. Again, these pictures here pick some of the operations. And, and it depicts some of the nighttime operations. Uh, the slide in the left, again, highlights how we're advancing that hose line up away from the fire apparatus to um, make all efforts to save homes and stop the fire from advancing, but get in a position where we can rapidly evacuate if necessary. On the right, uh, we are engaging the fire attack using that deck gun of you know, 1,000 gallons per minute that I referenced. One thing that always stands out to me in this picture is that one half of the street's on fire and one half of the street still has Christmas lights on. Um, very challenging time of the year. Um, I, I wanted to be noted that the family that lives at this home has uh, ring camera footage of our crews operating and has since visited the crews that were here that day. Next slide. 
again, a great deal of our efforts were one to make sure that we could support um, Boulder County, um, help extinguish that fire and, and, and stop the advance of that fire, protect homes, protect, um, stop the advancement even towards our, our jurisdiction, um, but to ensure that we had coverage for the Westminster community. So at the peak, we had five fire engines deployed and two battalion chiefs deployed to the marshal. But what we had here in Westminster, as you can see, is one battalion, SAM officer, safety medical officer, I'm sorry, truck two truck companies, two engines, a brush truck, and an additional medic unit from our normal um, operation. So six medic units were in service. We had adequate coverage to cover any emergency that were to occur in the city of Westminster. And as I mentioned before, we are in direct communication with the North Area agencies. There were some agencies um, that had called back to emergency personnel, but did not deploy to the same level um, that we did to marshal fire. So they were available uh, for mutual aid, automatic aid response. We had mutual aid agreements with almost every department in the metro area and even automatic aid, automatic aid agreements with um, neighboring agencies. So we are able to bring in additional resources into Westminster if there were to be a significant event. Uh, next slide, please. After the deployment of the second battalion, engine one, engine two, fire department command staff reported to dispatch. And there we had police supervisors as well as dispatch supervisors at what we are um, terming our operation cell. And what we were doing at that point is really projecting to say, if this fire were to extend towards Westminster, what are our operations here? What are our contingency plans? We were going through contingency planning to ensure that we could respond to any emergency lo locally. We are also monitoring the pre-evacuation and evacuation notices that were coming out from Boulder um, Office of Emergency Management, as well as the incident management team from that incident. Um, while in that operation cell, um, we did note that the pre-evacuation had moved further east and captured an area west of Sims which ultimately captured the Meadowview subdivision, which was approximately 19 homes. Um, those residents would receive those notifications from Boulder OEM and that IAMT, but to ensure that our residents received those notifications, our police and fire dispatch initiated a code red alert um, to, those, um, to those homes, was able to geofence that area and send a code red alert to that location. In addition, Westminster police officers responded to that area and knocked on doors to advise residents that they were in a pre-evacuation area. Once Boulder OEM advanced that pre-evacuation to an evacuation order, then we sent an additional code red alert to, the, to that location to ensure that our residents were aware. Uh, next slide. Early on in the incident, um, we, throughout the day we were in, when I say throughout the day, you know, within an hour or so of that, Marshall Fire starting, we were in direct contact with CMO, ICD staff, as well as some of our emergency operations center team members. And we were discussing contingency plans and, and even discussed if there was a need to set up a shelter location in Westminster for those that would be evacu or had to evacuate from the Marshall Fire. In our communications with Boulder, it was determined that there was not a need for a Westminster shelter to support the evacuation. Um, however, once we had Westminster residents that were in a mandatory evacuation zone, we activated our emergency operations center and started to put plans in place to set up a shelter for Westminster residents. Um, the the lo shelter location was identified as the MAC and that's the, the plan we put in place. Um, Chief two, as well as we had a Westminster police officer at the command post. And so we started to get some information that indicated that the mandatory evacuation order for our area would be of short duration. And so at that point, then we started to scale back those plans to open the shelter. Let's see if there's any questions for me before I turn it over to Dibshi. Um, Need some water? I'll take one. I'll go get you. I just know what it's like to have to keep talking. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Councilor Azadi. Thank you, Mayor. Quick question. You mentioned that the surrounding communities, that sometimes they get involved more so than other times. What triggers other cities to come into another city to help with more resources? What's the criteria there? Uh, thank you, Councilor Azadi. If I understand the question correctly, I think 
um, you're asking in reference to my statement that some agencies did not respond to the same degree that we did. And why is there a difference? Um, it, a lot of, it just depends on the resource ordering. So the incident command team is uh, responsible for, for in this case, uh, the Marshall Fire, that incident command team is responsible for requesting resources. So they'll work through their county emergency management or the dispatch center to call resources. And so what they'll do if they're looking for a five engine, they might, they usually call the closest first. Obviously Westminster is close, closer than some of the other agencies, Adams County, South Adams County that I referenced. So when they start to get those orders in, those resources in, they usually don't extend until later. So area plans that you can call Western Dispatch Center and get five engines from five different fire departments. So a total, one from each department of five total. So it just depends on what they're looking for and how that communication center or emergency management requests the resource. If there are no more questions for me. I'll turn it over to. Oh, I know. Whoops. Go ahead, Councilor Baker. Yeah, I just want to clarify this in my mind. So at the peak of the fire, we had five fire engines mm -hmm. sent away, and those are our five regular engines. We there are yes, Councilor Baker, that is correct. We had at the peak five fire engines. Those and are those, all our regulars. Those five would be our frontline um, fire engines. And then the two fire engines and the two trunk companies here were all from our reserves. The truck companies, they did not deploy. So the two truck companies were still our primary apparatus, our primary trucks for the city. The engine seven and eight that came in, those were reserve units um, that use, utilizes reserve and uh, surplus equipment. We, we call it surge equipment to surge up our resources. Um, they were equipped with surge um, equipment to be able to respond to emergencies in Westminster. Right, and refresh my memory is mm -hmm. the difference between engines and trucks. Um, you know, they're, they're similar in the fact that they both have a 500 gallon, you know, tank and they have similar pumping capacities of how much water that they can um, flow through hose lines or deck guns. But a truck company has a large 105 foot aerial ladder on top of it, where the engine company relies um, on the ground ladders, you know, extension ladders. And how many how many personnel were how many personnel were with each of the deployed engines? Um, our second model would have been three firefighters for each engine, and then a battalion obviously is an individual resource. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. And is Chief Hose going to talk about the hoses that were left in the street and why? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I well, you would see pictures, and then when I heard the story, it's sort of chilling. So. I just want to be sure you shared. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. We need to get the slides back to where we started. <laughs> well, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Thank you for having us do this presentation. And let me get to the spot here. So, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, a little bit about um, what had happened that night. Um, after we had the resources in the city, we were working on those. We had decided, determined that it would be best for, for us to get our eyes on it. Um, it's my eyes up to ourselves. So, with the city covered, at that time, I was able to go up to the incident command post at Flatirons and make contact with um, basically the deputy operations chief at the command post liaison officer, the police department. We, I think uh, Trevor Matarasso, the commander was mentioned earlier, he was actually assigned to the command post. So able to make contact with him. And we were able to establish direct communications with the command post to determine where the fire was, where it was going, uh, things of that nature. So we had a good idea for Westminster just to get as much advance notice as we could for any situation there. Um, during the incident when I was not at the command post, I was able to actually go up to Highway 128 down on Sims and down on El Dorado Road and try to monitor those fire and the weather conditions. And um, I've mentioned this before in the presentations, when you get up there and you see that it was devastating. You would just see um, down in the lower areas, you'd see blocks that were burning. Block here, block over here, back over here with, with areas in between that were either burned out or hadn't been affected yet. The other part is knowing that the winds as strong as they were, all of the flame, all of the smoke was basically horizontal. 
So it was it was blowing it so hard and thinking about the crews out there trying to intercede as the photograph showed. So you could you could really see that the the difficulty in trying to get ahead and, and try to handle that fire um, at that time. But one of the things that immediately I noticed that was beneficial for Westminster was the direction, the wind direction was at that time out of the southwest. And um, again, trying to judge the weather conditions and see, you know, as the evening progressed and things and and how um, how everything was happening there. So being able to relay back to the emergency operations center to, to Chief Burke in that center, what the current conditions were, where the fire was, um, Highway 128 was not closed. They didn't have that closed at all. So that's a sign that there, there was no threat really moving that way. So we were able to do that uh, timely, um, accurate reporting there. And one of the things that we received is obviously the pre-evacuation notices from Boulder OEM. And then when I was at the incident command post, they were you know, looking at, well, we're not really concerned about that area right now. But we also have to remember that Boulder OEM is looking at a larger picture of you know, more future. Incident command is looking at more immediate areas. So we just wanted to make sure that the messaging we were receiving was correct. And we had that information to make those really good decisions in the EOC. So um, as the evening progressed, the weather obviously calmed down. Uh, making those runs, the smoke went to more vertical, the winds calmed. It gave the crews a chance to get in and actually do some some really good work. And um, one of the uh, uh, second deployment, when we had a battalion chief up there along with those five engines, they all were able to work together. And at one point, our crews were able to, uh, say, kind of draw a line in the sand up there with the, the houses, made a stand, and they were able to make a stop on that section of fire where they were at. So between our crew's work and in the, the weather conditions, it, it assisted that we were able to make that stop up there. Um, you could tell the difference there immediately. Um, and as I went up to the uh, area on 128 and looked down there, you could see that those blocks of fire had darkened down. So they were they were making some significant progress. Um, next slide, please, Amy. Oh. So we talked about the equipment damage. <clears throat> We had, um, if you recall that one photograph where Chief Burke was discussing the engine pointed out and the hose lines down the street, um, the crew on engine three, the crew would continuously move down as they would try to protect a house. And as that house became involved, they would move to the next one and try to stop that fire. And they would advance down the street. Literally, they would keep that fire, trying to hold it in check. And they moved to the end of the block until they had to literally cut and run. And as you can see from the photographs here, the photograph on the left, that's one of our large five inch supply line fire hoses. And that's where they actually did have to cut the hose to be able to, to go. And they would go to the next block, try to set up again, try to set up another area and, and defend that, that block area. Um, what would happen is they were, each block that this happened, obviously were running out of hose. They couldn't roll it up, they couldn't restack it. They were literally having to leave that area so quickly. So they abandoned the hose in place and they started abandoning adapters. <clears throat> when some uh, the other crews were able to, or they arrived, they actually said, we're out of hose on the truck. We need to start using yours to make these stands. So it was such a tight race that they waited till the last minute before they were able to, to get out of there and move to the next section. Um, the crews went back later on and uh, tried to get uh, any equipment, retrieve the equipment they could that they had abandoned. And uh, some of the crews were telling us that literally they had hose in the street they couldn't get because it had melted into the asphalt area of the street. It was that hot on both sides of the street and they just had to abandon what it was. And again, you can see from the other photographs here, the, the burn marks in some of this hose. So um, we had a lot of hose that was that was destroyed in this, in this incident. Um, again, luckily for, for us, for the other agencies, uh, no injuries, no nothing there except from the fire, fire crews, but we did have a lot of damaged property. Um, next slide, please. So after the incident, we have conducted inventories for lost equipment, damaged equipment, uh, destroyed equipment. Um, we were working on our staffing hours and the costs, um, again, for responding and for the backfill crews that we had. And we're, we're still trying to get those costs down. You know, it's, it's a lot of work to try to get all the different costs in there. We're still working on that. But part of that is that with this being a state declared um, disaster, we are eligible for the for um, uh, reimbursement of funding once it became that. So there's a time frame in there where initially we provided that mutual aid, and that mutual aid is up and down. There's 52 departments in the front range that have that um, 
mutual aid con, uh, consortium there. And so we provide mutual aid. We receive mutual aid depending on the size of the fire. Uh, we've had some large fires in the last few years here in Westminster, and we've received aid from outside jurisdictions, both responding to the fire and then covering our firehouses for, for those things. So we, you know, we provide that mutual aid. So for the first approximately 12 hours, that's just one of those costs that departments have, cities have, districts have. You, you do that. Once it becomes the state designated fire, then your costs become reimbursable, including your uh, personnel costs, your equipment costs, the cost of the vehicles, things of that nature. So what we're currently, uh, the process we're at right now is we have opened the state forms. We're putting information in there for the damaged equipment and, and the uh, personnel costs and things of that nature so that we can be reimbursed. Part of the, the, the incident, uh, the damage to the equipment we have to actually wait until those invoices are here and the equipment is here before we can submit those invoices to the state. And, you know, part of that, I believe, is you have some departments that might say, well, just pay us for the equipment and you don't know where, you know, you may have something with that, but we have to have those invoices turned in. So there is a process that takes a while. We have ordered that equipment that we did. We were able to put our, our trucks back in service that night when they got back, because again, that's why we have extra supplies, extra hose, in the fire stations and we keep those reserve supplies there for just for that purpose if we need those. And again, we have placed orders for the equipment that was, it was damaged or destroyed. So, uh, next slide, please. So some of the things that we're doing now is, and, and you've heard, I'm sure a lot of bit about public notification. Um, those are things that our emergency communication section is working on is rave or, um, you know, different code red, things of that nature. and looking at evaluating those systems, what's gonna be best for us. Um, so that's something that I have more information to speak on, but really that's our emergency communication center that's working on those programs. So that's part of it, <clears throat> providing that information. Another piece that I think you'll hear a touch of later on is on their hazard mitigation plan that we've had in the city. This is an ongoing uh, requirement that we have that hazard mitigation plan in place. And it just happens that it's due again in 2023. Um, this has been grant funded for us to do that study and get that hazard mitigation plan uh, again renewed. And obviously wildland is, is always a piece of that. And then the other part that again, you'll hear later on is the evaluation and implementation of any mitigation strategies within the city and with our surrounding areas. Any questions? Councilor Yuzadi. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I have two questions. One, um, What's the criteria for a state fire? Uh, one said, I don't, know, I don't know the exact state criteria, but I know the state is when it gets to a certain size or extent or loss, that's when the state will make a declaration that this is a disaster. Basically, it's, it's similar like a federal declaration of a disaster. Um, for the wildland fires, because we don't do a lot of wildland here, we assist on those. I don't know the exact criteria they have for that one. And, and you mentioned that, that you're still going through an audit of the loss, but do you have a rough estimate of how much loss, like quantity-wise and value-wise, even if it's a range of what kind of loss are we talking about? So we had approximately a little over $11,000 in just damaged and destroyed equipment, um, about another $1,000 in vehicle costs. And by vehicle costs, uh, you think about those engines up there, and running for many hours, pulling in that air with all of the contaminants. So a lot of the filter systems and things and the, the oil and things in the, in the vehicles had to be changed. So fleet tracked all of those costs. And so we have that information in there also. And that's that's about $1,000 for the filters and, and things of that nature. And then um, um, personnel costs, we, we are tracking those. Um, the backfill overtime the day of the incident was a little over $6,600 for our backfill to keep everything in service. Um, the next day, we also deployed some resources uh, to assist, and that's when it became reimbursable, and that was about $7,500. We, we are also sending in billing for our crews that were working that day, because obviously those are not extra costs that we incurred. Those are the standard costs. Those are about sixty-six dollars to $6,700 for those people that were scheduled, but we're still going to submit all of that to the state and then they'll evaluate it and they'll know where that line is as far as when it became reimbursable and be able to just separate those costs. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation and for all the people who went and helped on this fire. And um, one question I have is, are you, as you're tracking this, 
is the city going to look at one cost for, because we also sent police officers up there, is my understanding. So when you give us the full cost, will it include that? Are they going to kind of do their separate thing and then city manager will give us full what, what we're out? It, you know, thanks, you know, Mayor Pro Tem. Appreciate the question. At, at this time, um, we're tracking the fire costs. I have not really spoken with the police to, to see if they are doing a separate tracking or if they're going to do joint. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is, I would ask you to give a plug for the people to sign up for the code red because I'll tell you the number one thing I heard being in the countryside neighborhood is the news. And I saw the news, and they said, "Oh, Westminster's evacuating." I can't tell you the flood of phone calls I got, and I'm like, "That's not happening." I was like literally having to tell people, don't, not yet, you know, pay attention. But um, so I certainly got a fair amount of people to sign up for that. But I figure it's a good time for you to give a plug for that if, you, if you're willing. Yes, sir. And that's a, so a service that obviously you can sign up for and, and get that as far as the code red service right now. And, and again, the emergency communications section is working on, if we're going to code red, rave, um, lookout alert. So there's different systems and, once those are in place, obviously we're going to use all of our social media and public education campaigns to make that make everybody aware of, of the, the system and how to sign up. Great, thank you. Councillor mm -hmm. Namel. Thank you for the presentation. It's like, I believe the third time that I've gotten to hear it, but I hear different things each time. And so one of the things that I'm remembering from a presentation you did a few weeks ago was, um, which was kind of indicated just how long folks have been out there that um, our firefighters were kind of going through their oxygen tanks and they kind of ran out of oxygen in some cases. And I'm just curious um, as we're looking at financial impacts, I mean, did they, were there any health impacts? Yeah, you know, I mean, so I know the fire and just breathing that in for extended amount of time. Oh, thank you for the question, Councillor. It's that's, Something we, we discussed a little bit, but it's we don't know really what those effects are going to be. Obviously, our, our crews did wear those SCBAs for the self-contained breathing apparatus. <clears throat> but at some point, they ran out. They ran out of air in that. They ran out of the spare bottles. There wasn't a, a method there to replenish that air. So they were working outside. And again, with the wind, the fire, the smoke, things of that nature. So um, we don't know what the, the long-term effects from that you know, will be. It's, just, it's something that you know we have that roster of the people that were there, and we will keep that information. Yeah. Thank you so much, and to the three of you that Chief, I know you got to just sit and listen, but um, please to to all three shifts, all six stations, let them know. We just say thank you to everybody wherever they were, however they helped. Um, it's you were a great neighbor, and thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Appreciate it. That brings us to public comment. And I understand we have two voicemails, two emails, and how many signed up? We have five signed up in the chambers this evening. Okay, let's get started. The first speaker is Craig Russell. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and I'd like to, to say I appreciate all the people that have gotten their awards, their long term of being with the city and the good job they've done, the firefighters, the police department. We, we truly do live in a wonderful city. Um, I also want to thank you, city council members. You, you spent uh, an incredible amount of time and effort in doing what you do. And, and, uh, probably a little more thankless job than some people think, but I do appreciate you and taking time to, to hear us and stuff. I'm a little disenchanted though, because I've been speaking to the city council since November and nobody on city council has reached out to talk to me about uh, the issues I've been talking about, which is the systematic inspection of the city of Westminster. Um, I understand that this form is to hear me but I thought with uh, true communication, it's also to reach out and talk back to me and let me know where we're standing on that. And that hasn't happened. Um, what I have heard through many of the, uh, the meetings that I've been to and stuff like that is that we're concerned about affordability and accountability in Westminster, especially in the housing area. And I offer affordability on all the, all the units that we run out here. I'm taking care of four different fourplexes 
And I offer them at a very affordable price. And the proof is my tenants stay there a very long time. But one of the things I can't control is property taxes and, and other bills that aren't consistent. And one of them is the city of Westminster. You guys, you know, we pay a licensing fee, but we're also paying an inspection fee. And, you know, that's a fee that, that first of all, we don't want. We didn't sign up for it, but it's forced upon us and we get fined if we don't pay it and we don't pay it on time. So we paid $160 for inspections and, you know, for a fourplex, it's $40 per unit. And in the last couple of years, they said, well, we can't do the inspections, but we're still going to charge you for it. Uh, they did the outside inspection. So basically uh, out of four things that they had to do, inspect four apartments and the outside, they just did the outside, but they charged me full boat for everything. And uh, lo and behold, it's a year later, they want to charge me again, full boat for everything, but yet they haven't done their job. And I'm a little frustrated with that. Also, according to your own, own charter, uh, section 1112-12 uh, B and C, it's supposed to be every two years, but yet we're getting charged every year for it. And I'm, I'm a little frustrated with that as well. So I'm, I'm hoping that again, we can look at that. I, I really feel that as renters, they're kind of being discriminated against. They're the ones least likely to come up here and complain. They're the ones least likely to do anything about it. So I've kind of taken it on myself to advocate for them a little bit by coming up and talking to you. I, mean, I feel they're being discriminated against because you know you have the right to go in and look and inspect their properties no one's inspecting your homes. Make sure they're safe for you to live in. Only that, that they're safe from, uh, you know, the landlords that I think most of them do a pretty good job. Some of them don't. I understand that. And that's why I've always kind of advocated that this could be a good program. I have asked city council to review this, this systematic inspection and take a look at it, if it's really doing what we intended it to do when it was brought on what, about 20 years ago. So I'm hoping that we'll still do that. So far, all I've gotten is city staff to tell me that what we're doing is absolutely perfect. We're completely right on everything we've got and we can justify everything that we're doing, even though I don't agree with it. Uh, they, they tend to agree with it themselves. So, and then their comeback as well. If there's gonna be any changes, council has to do the changes. That's why I've come to council. So I'm hoping that we'll at least have the time. And I understand you're very busy. I understand that. But this has been since you've all become council members in November. So I'm asking for you to take the time and let's really look at this and see if we're not a um, little nickel and dime in these people to death on that. So I'll let you get back to it. And thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next speaker is Kathy Mallory. Hi, I'm Kathy Mallory. I was here two weeks ago, uh, live in the Spanish Oaks uh, condominium complex. Um, I wanted to come and give you an update. And there have been changes, and I want to thank, I don't know, uh, Councillor Baker has communicated with some of the people that came last time. And um, my one of my big concerns was fire mitigation because the city has not mowed that open space um, for over over well over a year. Somebody came out about a week and a half ago, and they they didn't mow the whole thing, but they did do along the property line, so it's not a true fire line because it didn't go down to the soil. But it certainly helps mitigate if there was an accidental fire. Um, I did walk the trails last weekend to see. And they have been cleaned up. I felt safer. There was um, there was a little bit of graffiti here and there, but considerably less than the last time I was down there. A lot less garbage, and I saw two ducks. So, good thing. A little bit, tiny bit of wildlife. Um, and then the campers in the open space have are slowly been moving. Um, how many tents are we down to now? Just one tent. I understand that it's gone tonight. It's back up. <laughs> It, well, it, was, it was not there at seven o'clock. <laughs> we watched it go down and then we saw it go back up. So we're not sure what's going on, but it's slowly. And the city came out and cleaned up a lot of the debris from the people who left earlier in the week. So um, what I would 
like to say is thank you for taking these steps and actions is really um, helpful for our community to know that action has been taken and things are improving. Um, the thing I worry about is the future because I want to make sure that that property, that open space is mowed on a right mode and taken care of so we can rid of reduce fire problems um, and how I don't know how we can prevent the um, unsheltered people from camping there again, but I, I don't know if there's a way to put up signs or something so that they know the rules and regulations that go with that property. And if they do this, this will happen so that we can ensure that this open space truly stays open for the whole community, not just certain people. So thank you again for all your support so far. Thank you for coming. We just ask everyone to just listen and um, we don't ask for outbursts, thanks. Um, we're here to listen no matter you're against or for, we just want to listen and get on with the meeting. Thank you. The next speaker is David DeBus, David DeBus. I'm DeBus, I'm sorry. Three weeks in a row, you've been stuck with me, Mayor Pro, Mayor Pro Tem, counselors and employees. Um, I've been here with you the last three Mondays in a row, and I thank you for the invitation to come to the study session last Monday. Councillor Baker, thank you for pointing out toward the end that there was space in there. I thought it was just you all at the big table, and I didn't realize there was room in the inn. Um, you have modeled for me over the past three weeks how government can and should work, and I really value and appreciate that. Your professionalism and your reception at the city council meeting two weeks ago was exemplary. Several of you came up to me and some of my neighbors at, our, at your break. Um, you met with us afterward, as did several of the officers from the police department, as did several city workers. So those were all really appreciated and valued. As Kathy said, um, the weed and grass mitigation has begun. Um, uh, Councilor Baker, you've done a great job keeping us in the loop with emails, and we really appreciate that. Mayor, you suggested that Access Westminster. Thank you. Didn't know about it. My own fault. Got on there. I don't know who was responsible for that, but that tagging and graffiti between 88th and 90th on the west side of Federal is gone, eradicated, looks phenomenal, looks like a great part of Westminster, not like a less desirable place. Again, the respectfulness and the um, responsiveness of all desire, of all departments has been great. Officer Hasi um, was, was also very helpful getting the camper um, that had been in our neighborhood for over five weeks removed. I also mentioned an issue last uh, meeting about city hours. Now, who wouldn't want a four-day work week? So I didn't want to leave the unfinished message because remember, I talked really, really quickly to get everything in in five minutes and I'm already running out of time again. But um, who wouldn't like a four-day work week? But I still need access to my city five days a week, if not six. But why not think about a four-day work week, Monday through Thursday for one of us and Tuesday through Friday for the others. Anyway, we, we have all sorts of possibilities. So I just wanted to put that on the record. I have seen an increase in patrol. I don't know if that's because of our presentation, if it's because of staffing, because I learned about that at the study session as well, how we're short officers and so on. But I've specifically noticed more patrol along Lowell Boulevard, especially in the school zones. I think that's admirable. You taught me a lot about um, the unsheltered and the homeless situation in our city. I really uh, valued and appreciated that. I couldn't believe all the information, 90 minutes worth just at your study session alone. So thanks so much. Somewhat as Kathy said also, I think as long as we citizens, um, neighbors, counselors, employees, departments, and so on know what the rules and regulations are, we can all work toward that common cause. But when um, those without a home don't know, when those of us that are paying taxes don't know, when sometimes the departments don't know, that's when it becomes difficult. So um, thanks for working really, really in tandem to get those things um, moving in the right direction. If we can continue to get it consistently enforced and patrolled, and again, all the rules posted and known by all, I don't know if as Councillor Baker has said, really truly is the park, are our parks and recs, are our open spaces really dust to dawn? I don't know what the hours are, I honestly don't. And I couldn't find that on the website, Mayor. Um, some of the links, just so you know, especially to the parks and rec um, do not work. So I couldn't find actually the rules for when our parks and rec or when our parks and open spaces open and so on. I think I shared with you last time I'm a former, I, I was born and raised in Denver, lived there until just a year and a half ago when I moved here. But what I did want you to know after you took this issue so seriously, I went back to Denver, I went to downtown. I don't know if any of you have driven around there lately. The homeless issues are being cleaned up around there. I then drove out west on Colfax. I don't know if any of you have driven out near Lakewood lately. 
but Lakewood is becoming not so desirable, at least along the areas in which I drove. And I certainly don't want to see our neighborhood looking like that. Again, I respect, admire, appreciate the plethora of issues that people go through for homelessness, but I also know there's many resources out there. I think you know that I'm a professor at Regis University. We've got a, a homeless encampment there. I know it's city and county of Denver, but a third of those spaces are empty. I don't understand it. I mean, I do, because again, I've lived amongst the homeless the 31 years I lived in downtown Denver. And again, you obviously understand those issues as many of your um, personnel also. So again, just big thanks and kudos. If you'd given me more time, I'm down to 36 seconds. I had a proclamation, pins, checks, but you didn't give me enough time. You held me to the five minutes. Maybe next time you'll give me a minute longer. Thank you again for all your hard work. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming tonight. Next. The next speaker is Alan Farb. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Um, homeless in Westminster. I spoke before Council on January 24th regarding, regarding our unhoused residents, people that are living on the street, and how then it broke my heart seeing women and men shivering in the cold. That happened even before the sub freezing weather that seemed to follow. I somehow missed a uh, council study session last Monday where a presentation on the homeless initiatives was provided. And though I did try to search for a transcript or an audio of that study session, uh, even until 4.30 this morning, I couldn't find anything on the website. To remind you all, I'm a 30-year resident of the city. I live in one of those nicer covenant-controlled neighborhoods that's bordered by two golf courses. And I have for two years every week worked as a volunteer street outreach worker delivering food, water, first aid and hygiene supplies, outerwear, underwear, Walmart and King Super's gift cards, blankets, tents, sleeping bags to anywhere from 30 to 50 women and men within our city limits. Sometimes people move or are moved but most are nearby and they're finding a different site to settle at. By reaching out as I do, I am not enabling these unhoused residents, nor am I encouraging them to continue the dismal lifestyle that many of them are trapped within. I'm offering a little comfort, a little aid, a connection to us, the housed residents, and some compassion and dignity. You see, counselors and mayor, I'm merely doing what I think the city should be doing on a large, proactive, and truly viable scale, and to do this with other neighboring cities. To some, the unsightly sites our unhoused neighbors inhabit equates only to trouble, to problems, but there is a distinction between people who cause problems and people who have problems. With poverty, substance abuse, physical abuse, mental illnesses, and other ill health conditions, these are people who have problems. And we, you and me, are failing to address them humanely. You were, I understand, provided during your study session last week, statistics on the number, gender, uh, diagnosed ill health and disabilities of some of those people, some of whom I know. I had noted at the January 24th council meeting of one man shivering uncontrollably in the very next sub freeze we all experience, that man had several fingertips amputated due to frostbite. Another chronically unhoused resident had his toes amputated due to that same weather event. A friend of his died on the street the day after he was released from the hospital, which was following a medical emergency that the day before while he lived on the street. A 30 something woman who was at least four months pregnant has had, had been reluctant to seek help because she fears hospitals and she fears government entities. These are all somebody's children, 
somebody's sister, somebody's brother, somebody's father, and somebody's mother. I think the majority, if not all of you on this council, do want to help our homeless, unhoused neighbors. I think you want to act on behalf of all of our residents. You don't want to be those who cause problems. You want to be the solution of those who have problems. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Robin Hannon is the next speaker. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me speak today, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and all the city council. So I'm not a part of Spanish Oaks, but I'm pretty surprised that everything that I've written down pretty much mirrors what they've been talking about. These are all people who care about the people living outside. And it doesn't matter if they have family or not. Many of the families don't even know that they're living outside. They don't even know where their loved ones are. Um, if the person in the tent was somebody in your family, you would want them to have help. And I don't think any of you would leave them outside to suffer during the searing heat, the freezing cold, the bugs, the rain. It's very horrible lifestyle. I'm actually a member of the unincorporated Adams community. I do not live in Westminster, but what happens on your border affects my border as well. And Parks and Urban Spaces, Adams County is on this side of Sheridan. So that's me as well. I'm a volunteer for Parks and Open Spaces. I have dealt and uh, talked to and given things to many of the people that live outside and I've heard their stories. A lot of people don't even know there's help to be had. Um, so the people that are mentally ill do not know they're mentally ill. They don't believe it. The people that have drug and alcohol problems most of them don't believe they are having problems. And those that do have really just accepted their lot in life. And they're just fine living in their tent, panhandling, doing whatever they can to get money. Um, it's a sad situation. They need your help. Uh, written some notes, sorry. This was okay. kind of a last minute thing. And I should mention that I was out of town for a funeral, which is why I did not prepare a friend whose family failed to get him help for his alcohol problems and ultimately he died. So it's a real thing. And to speak to the gentleman that mentioned of a pregnant woman, it was recently, I believe it was in Broomfield, she was giving birth unattended and she died because of complications. So we've got women, men, and like he said, brothers, sisters, fathers and mothers all need help. So everyone here can either intervene or enable. And from what I understand, you need a judicial abatement to get people removed. That shouldn't be, in my opinion. In unincorporated Adams, we have park rangers now because the homeless problem has gotten so big. Every time Denver does a sweep, even though they're still taking money for the road home, they sweep them out, they come into Adams. We don't have the funds for it. And here in Westminster, as a city, I'm hoping you'll take more responsibility for the people and stop leaving it to the county because unincorporated really needs all of that help. We don't have city officials, we have just the county. So I'd like for you to lift that requirement, do whatever it takes to give them a shorter notice, because here's what you have to look forward to if you don't start intervening sooner. Uh, deep pits filled with feces and urine because they don't have places to urinate and defecate. We have needles in areas where children play and they fish with their fathers, little girls in sandals. Waterways have needles and all kinds of trash. Uh, people that need help and don't know how to get help end up with 911 calls, which 
a bit of a drain, not that it's, they're not deserving, but it's a bit of a drain on emergency personnel and police. And everyone here, you can do something and intervene in people's lives. Let them know about the resources that are out there. There was one woman who didn't know that she qualified for housing. They were able to get her into housing within three weeks and unincorporated. I know all of you care, and you can do similar things to help people get off the streets. So that's it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Do we have anyone else or do we just have our voicemails? Nope, that was the last person who had signed up. So we do have... We do have two voicemails. Can we go ahead? And because I can ask if anybody, if there's anybody that didn't get to speak, let's listen to the voicemails and then you have time to speak. Go ahead. This is Chris Stimson uh, living in the Cotton Creek area. Uh, Madam Mayor and uh, City Councillors, we have heard much in the last two weeks on the subject of homelessness in Westminster. We have heard residents of Spanish Oaks express their fears that nearby homeless people are untidy and putatively criminal. We've heard at least one councillor characterize the homeless as actual criminals in a way that recalls the damage done to Hoovervilles by local police authorities in the 1930s. Here's what's going on at present. We know that there are more homeless people than ever these days. At the most recent council study session, it became clear from their comments that the priorities of some councillors are to instruct the police department what to do about or against homeless encampments. It is beyond argument that most people are uncomfortable with such campsites close to their homes, and a city council might rightfully consider it their responsibility to alleviate the concerns of city residents. But there must come a point at which councils and all residents of a city remit their abhorrence at the unsightliness of the homes of the homeless and understand what it means to be human. The problem of homelessness is not one caused by a single city or town. It's a product of many influences, statewide, national or global, an uncertain economy, lack of affordable housing, periods of high unemployment, mental health issues, substance dependency, globalization, marital dysfunction, and more. But when a person or family becomes homeless, they do so within the limits of a city, whether it's Aguila or Yuma or anywhere in between. A homeless person is part, like it or not, of the city in which they pound their tent stakes into the ground. And the chances are they did not migrate from one city to another to do this. So even though it was probably not Westminster's doing, that this person or that family ended up under a tarpaulin on waste ground near your house. They are now irrevocably Westminster's problem. And it's here that we have the opportunity as individuals or a community to show that we are not just taxpaying citizens, but real human beings. If we take the trouble to look around the country, we'll find examples of administrations carrying out initiatives which put the welfare and rehabilitation of these most disadvantaged people ahead of the notion of punishing them. The Housing First initiatives of our neighbor state of Utah is a good example. And yes, these initiatives cost money. But I cannot imagine a more transcendental joy than knowing that just one of my escrow payments on my single family house took a person plowed under by life and gave them the resources and the care to start to restructure their life from the nadir it most recently occupied. All it would take would be for me to be human. Now, if my appeal for humanity has fallen on deaf ears, if councillors regard their responsibilities as being biased toward law and order to the extent that humanity is nugatory, I should remind them or perhaps just inform them of a legal inconvenience. More than two years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that homeless people cannot be criminally punished for sleeping outside if no alternatives exist. So, what alternatives exist in Westminster? There are some hotel rooms for isolation in the case of COVID exposure, applications for housing vouchers when available. What about Adams County? Apparently, there is shelter and rental assistance for families with children. But of course, that doesn't cover everyone, does it? And here's the point that is so obvious it should scarcely need to be enunciated. 
if alternatives existed, we would not be losing sleep over the number of Hoovervilles within the bounds of Westminster, disturbing taxpaying residents with their mere existence. So we have to conclude that alternatives do not exist and therefore the Supreme Court ruling should apply. I should add in the name of full disclosure that that Supreme Court ruling targets the Ninth Circuit Court ruling and the Ninth Circuit does not include Colorado. But it's well known that Supreme Court rulings set national precedents. So any attempt to circumvent such a ruling will probably run afoul of the law. Here's an idea. Treat other human beings with humanity. Thank you. Hello, councillors and mayor. This is David Carpenter. I live at 10762 Ross Court in Westminster. I'm calling to formally support your resolution number 13, which will uh, relinquish state control of Sheridan Boulevard from 88th Avenue North to the US 36 interchange. Uh, I do believe that this is a good idea as far as maintenance for the city, especially with the reconstruction project already underway. However, I do request that you add an amendment to this. Uh, you should, the addition should state that CDOT shall continue to sign Colorado Highway 95 from the US 36 interchange to 88th Avenue on all overhead and ground mounted signs to promote route continuity for Colorado Highway 95. It doesn't always seem like CDOT's priority is maintaining right route continuity and the short distance between 88th Avenue and US 36 won't be noticed by the general public that it's a city of Westminster route. And therefore keep the signage on 36. So, and I think we're good to go. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, have a great night, everybody. Goodbye. That's the last voicemail. Thank you. If there's anyone in the audience that didn't get a chance to sign up, came in late, or just decided to speak to us, speak now or forever hold your peace. Come to the podium. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor Pedali. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Andres Carrera, and I serve as Denver Metro Regional Director for Senator Hickenlooper. I've had the pleasure to meet a lot of you, but I'd like to acknowledge you in this room here tonight. Uh, Mr. Andrews, Councillor Baker, Seymour, and Emmons, uh, Mayor McNally, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dumont, good to see you again. Councillors Normella, Eziati, good to see you, sir. Uh, Mr. Frankel and Ms. Fitch again. Thank you so much for allowing me to address your council. Even it's uh, briefly tonight, I only have five minutes, so councillors and mayor, I will keep my remarks short. Mostly I'm here to introduce myself, establish a relationship with council and staff. Um, I know everyone here has an incredible job. You have 113,000 residents is one of the largest cities in Colorado, and, and it's your responsibility to look out for them. And so then I'm here to say, you know, to say that I, I'll, I wanna be your partner in, in that big mission um, and see how the federal government can show up for every single man, woman, and child who calls himself a resident of Westminster. And so then, you know, in that journey, I've been with this office now for about a year. I've had great conversations with Mr. Chris Lindsay, Juliet Abdel over at the Westminster Chamber of Commerce and Ryan McCoy with Westminster Public Schools. So I'd like to think I know a thing or two about Westminster, but there's always room to learn more. Um, and so then I know you've had, as this uh, you know session has proven, I know you've been tracking a number of key issues among them, homelessness, of course there's violent crime. You'd like to learn a little bit more about federal infrastructure and Boy, do I have information to share. Um, also, wildfires and open spaces is very much, you know, at top of mind for a lot of folks in Westminster. And importantly, there's a new bird camera at the Stanley Lake, which I read a little bit about on the Westminster window. Um, but we'll keep things, uh, you know, at a high level and really brief. You know, the biggest thing that I have to report out, I've got three things. First, congressional earmark spending, how we can bring millions of dollars to the city of Westminster. Second, our federal infrastructure package, also has a lot of millions of dollars for city of Westminster. And third, what the Senator is doing when it comes to fire prevention and open space. And so again, you know, out of respect for time, I'll keep things high level with a congressionally directed spending program. This one's very exciting. Hickenlooper and our office, we were able to bring 64 projects statewide, more than $100 million. Again, that's $100 million to the state of Colorado. Governments and nonprofits are eligible. And this is for things like parks, 
um, a renovated, you know, uh, a senior center. Um, I'll give you an example. Over in Adams County, we were able to provide five hundred thousand dollars to the Adams County Food Bank to purchase a new building to render services to the clients. We also got one point three five million dollars to the city of Aurora to set up a safe parking spot, uh, parking space rather, so that we can provide our unhoused residents, who I know we've chatted a lot about tonight, every opportunity to succeed. We were also able to provide five hundred thousand dollars to CU Anschutz. To, to stand up a maternal mortality program, uh, specifically taking a look at why Colorado is uh, unfortunately a leader in the African-American maternal mortality space. And so then uh, we've, uh, we're the drop dead deadline for this program is Friday, April 8th at 11.59 p.m. Um, I, between now and then, that's basically my sole purpose in life, is evaluating those applications that come through. We'd love to see the city of Westminster apply. You know, had great conversations with different stakeholders in your incredible city already. And I'd love to have conversations with every single member of this council, of course, you ma'am as well, and any other member of staff, so we can figure out how many millions of dollars we can and we should bring to the city of Westminster. I understand federal infrastructure, moving on to my second piece for tonight, um, is of top, is of, uh, at top uh, of mind for a lot of city council members, and of course, you ma'am as well. Um, you know, I just, I came bearing gifts, I came bearing gifts. I have gigantic packets of information, which I'll drop off to uh, the different members on this panel here. Uh, before I leave tonight, the important thing to realize here is that Colorado is expected to receive $6.2 billion, that's billion with a B, in federal funding over the next five years. Now, $3.7 billion of that is for 3,600 miles of highway repairs, $917 million is for public transportation improvements, and about $700 million is to improve water infrastructure across the state. To ensure clean and safe drinking water is a reality for every single resident, which, of course, we know is, is an issue not just here in the Denver metro, but of course, statewide. Um, and so then, you know, I'll drop off information about how we can make some of those uh, $6.2 billion a reality for the people here in Westminster. The short answer, folks, is that the federal, uh, the federal government has still has a lot of this money that they're hanging on to for competitive grants. And so then again, I'd love to sit down with uh, members of, uh, you know, of this council. Uh, and any of your staff in order to drive that point home and in order to see how we can claw some of those federal dollars, again, to the city of Westminster. Since we just had the Marshall fire fires and, of course, the NCAR fires, I believe, continue to rage on, I wanted to touch a little bit in my last 35 seconds on what the senator is doing to combat fire prevention and promote open space at the same time at the federal level. We're co-sponsors of the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Act, um, which you know, or the CORE Act, which moves wilderness boundaries away from you know major thoroughfares like I-70. We also uh, highly support robust National Guard funding to support firefighter efforts in the West. And here in this most recent omnibus package, this whole national budget, we uh, were very supportive of the $5.5 billion set aside for the wildland fire management um, that Congress appropriated specifically for that. All of this I'd like to localize for the city of Westminster. What does it mean for your fire and, uh, fire and rescue folks? What does it mean for your police officers? We'd love to have those conversations. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. You yeah. can leave those with um, our city clerk. Fantastic, will do. Anyone else? Welcome. Good evening, John Palmer, 8571 Lowell Boulevard. Uh, City Manager Andrews, I would like to thank your staff for reaching out earlier this week, or excuse me, last week, in regards to the 11.513 ordinance. Spent some time with them, uh, gave them some input. Very much appreciate that. Next, uh, now that we've got the water rates and tiers straightened out, I believe the citizens were promised access to real-time billing and actual gallons billing. And I believe that was promised to us early this year. I'm just kind of curious where we're at with that and when that will come forward to us. Also at last council meeting, I had asked about the late fee and how much profit the city was making there. I haven't heard anything back about that, how much money we we're generating in late fees. So if we could get somebody to circle back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 
That brings us to report of city officials, city manager. I'm sure you have a ton to answers and I'm sorry that those folks left so that they could be educated with what all is happening. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, city councilors. Um, a few comments tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. First, um, I would like to thank all of our speakers who spoke tonight. Uh, we do listen to everything that you say and we do follow up uh, if you've requested it and we will follow up with uh, each of those of you who have um, requested it. Um, tonight, uh, I would like to highlight that following that second open space fire in Boulder this weekend near the NCAR Center, uh, it's very timely that we have two presentations on fires and open spaces tonight. The first, of course, you already heard from deputies Burke and Hose on the Marshall Fire. We'll also follow up later tonight with the presentation from Chief Hall and our Parks, Recreation and Libraries Director, uh, Tomas Mischler, on the city's efforts to prevent and respond to, if needed, fires in our own open spaces. I believe City Council and our community members will find both of those uh, these presentations tonight informative, particularly as uh, noted earlier, uh, since we had Westminster Fire Department crews helping to fight both of those recent Boulder fires. I'm pleased to report today and along these lines that we welcomed nine new firefighters to the Westminster Fire Department today. And I know that they join one of the most prepared and professional fire departments in the country. Next, I wanna update you on the city's response to homelessness, both locally and regionally. We have been working hard to respond to the growing issue of homeless encampments in our community. And although many of them have uh, left this evening, I wanna thank our Spanish Oak uh, neighborhood friends uh, for coming back tonight and speaking to us as a follow-up to the concerns that they've raised um, and uh, do appreciate their ongoing input uh, as we work to resolve the issues in their, in their neighborhood. Um, I wanted to tell them tonight that uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, more city uh, crews will arrive to remove the remaining um, material in that location and also to begin the reparation work for that open space, including um, probably some retort, uh, restorative um, fencing, signage and re uh, restoration work. We're also working with um, the director on longer term potential redesigns of that, of that open space um, to add value to the neighborhood. So we, we wanted to assure that community that we're working on that. Uh, and I also want to assure the rest of our community we will continue uh, to address homelessness in our in our in our city. Um, we intend to bring regular updates on our efforts to city council and the public, including new protocols and resources that we're implementing to respond more effectively and quickly to both help the individuals affected as well as to protect our public spaces. I would also like to briefly update you on the status of collective bargaining in our police department. Last week, Westminster police officers and sergeants voted to accept the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge 25, also uh, we call the FOP, as their bargaining unit. The FOP is interested in learning more about a process of negotiation called interest-based bargaining that we have used with our firefighters, and we are scheduling an information session in April for the FOP and key police staff as our next step. Finally, I wish to note that we've begun street paving season beginning today in the countryside neighborhood. Our Public Works and Utilities team and their contractors began to repave and improve our city streets. We have a full list of streets that will be repaved this year on the street improvements page of our city website, and that's cityofwestminster.us forward slash cone zone. So check that out if you're interested to see what uh, upcoming work is. And we're also going to hear tonight um, a little bit later from Street Operations Manager Kurt Muehlmeyer, We'll be presenting an overview of our maintenance program for city streets, as well as um, um, reviewing our pavement quality index. And then he'll be able to answer any questions that you have. And that's all I have tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Council, have any questions? Uh, city Council comments. Mayor Perkin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everybody who came to speak tonight. Um, although it looks like maybe hopefully you'll catch up because it looks like a lot of the crowd didn't wait out for us. But mm -hmm. um, one thing, Quickly, I wanted to comment to the city manager. Um, if we could do a renter um, program review for, for the rental program, program, that this is a pretty new council. I've, I can't even think of a time since uh, 19 that we've had a presentation on that. So I, I don't know, besides the mayor and I, if anybody on the council has been through that as a council member, maybe sitting in the back of the room, potentially for some of us, but I think it makes sense. We've heard a lot about it and I certainly have some interest in it. And I would like to be able to hear the program and evaluate it and see if we would like any changes. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about quickly is just some of the um, 
comments that we heard on homelessness and uh, some of the phone callers, if you saw me shake my head, I was because I, I, dis, I dislike very much dishonesty. If you're going to call and you're going to talk about what we did last week, at least be honest about what we did. And I would encourage anybody who was here tonight to actually listen to that study session. Mr. Farby, I actually will shoot you an email with a link to that meeting. And because what you heard in that meeting is a balanced approach that the majority of this council wants. Uh, what, what we did in that meeting was we directed staff additional resources so that we have another homeless navigator so that we can connect people to those resources. Because I think the majority of this council does want to humanely address folks, see how we can connect them, but also wants a line where it's, you know, there's law that we have to hold. Um, and I think that that's good for the folks experiencing homelessness and those in the community. So I would encourage people to actually go listen to that whole, the whole thing, not just the folks that you, that you like on council and those that you don't, um, because honestly, uh, the, it doesn't help our community when people want to put forward things that are just bits and pieces. And I've seen, typically I wouldn't say anything about that, but just recently, even with the, what we did with the water rates, I've seen a lot of disinformation out on social media and they're typical people who have done a lot of activism, which I'm not against. I'm glad that people participate in the process. However, when you start saying things like this council is just kicking the can, we're not going to plan for the future when we specifically picked a rate plan that actually does address the future with dollars higher than what I originally thought that we should do. Um, I think that that's unfair to what this council as a team is trying to uh, accomplish. And it really doesn't help the community in a whole because it, it uh, just weaves division. And I think that in this country, we really could uh, get past some of that. That kind of gets to some of my other quick comments. And this is to my colleagues. Um, I had recently asked that we look at our protocols, both for our legislative protocols, as well as this council's protocols. And those protocols deal with a couple of things. The council protocols deal with how we're going to talk to each other, how we're going to talk to staff, how we're going to communicate, and how we're going to treat each other. Um, I would encourage us each to reread those and, and think about how we're going to communicate with each other. I'll give you an example of something that's frustrating to me is um, this is our time to talk to each other in public. Um, if you have things that you want to share with the whole group and you do it in email, we risk having a virtual meeting by us replying. So if a member of the community goes and pulls those emails, it looks like either we agree with something or we disagree with something or we're just not paying attention because we can't really communicate in that way in those emails and it becomes very frustrating for me. Um, one of the other areas is the legislative policy. I've multiple times heard somebody on this council um, state that somehow we're not being transparent by following our legislative protocol. Last um, session, the mayor asked our city attorney to describe areas where we're allowed to pull on things that we don't actually make policy on. I think that's very important for the public to understand that. And I would actually ask um, those protocols if we could make them part of the minutes for this meeting so that people can go and read them on our next agenda. Because that's our process, folks, that we agreed to, the majority agreed to. And if you are outside of the majority, I, I'm sorry, but it's four people and that's how we decide how we're going to operate. And so those are the rules. And if you want to advocate to change the rules, then you should advocate to change the policy. You shouldn't demonize your colleagues for doing something that's somehow below boards or non-transparent because that's not fair when the majority of the group said, here's what we're going to do. And here's the rules that we're going to live by. So um, again, these are a little different comments for me, but I think it's important because I think it's important also that this team works in as much unity as possible understanding the one thing that we should be able to unify on as we want to work well together and we want a better Westminster. And I think that airing these kind of things when they, they arise is important for us to be able to do that. Councillor Baker. Uh, so many things in our world and in our life are interconnected in all kinds of strange and interesting ways. I couldn't help but smile when we did our Tree City USA proclamation. The native state of Westminster would only have trees growing in the river valley. That'd be big dry and little dry, wouldn't it? There'd be no other trees in Westminster, maybe one or two here or there. But our ancestors a long time ago wanted to make an oasis here. They actually had orchards, I've been led to believe in the city. They wanted to turn the water resources that very thoughtful people 
a hundred years ago set aside for us to turn us into an oasis and to make us a tree city and enjoy the benefits the trees give and the life it presumes, we need water to do that. And besides the city's, what, 14,000 trees that we have, we rely on the 33,000 water customers to add their share to it. So we need reasonable water rates for everyone if we're going to be a tree city. And if we don't, don't want to do that, that's where the discussion needs to lie. Which brings us to another division, uh, the homeless issue or unhoused or whatever you want to call it. Uh, like the water issue, uh, there's a tendency to have what Arthur Brooks called moral motive asymmetry. And this is where you think the person opposing you isn't driven by the moral motive you have, but by some evil motive, something bad. Well, that uh, sort of precludes discussion, doesn't it? It sort of precludes conversation, doesn't it? Of course it does. If you think that someone you're talking to is motivated by the most evil and sinister of uh, uh, ideas, how can you really talk with him? How can you really have a conversation with him? Uh, there is compassion for those among us who don't choose to live like us. I find it very disappointing when we try to assume that those people are broken somehow. Some of them are, but some of them have made a choice, a conscious choice. And they are fellow members of our society and entitled to every right that we have. And they're also under the obligation to follow all the rules the rest of us follow. A government that does not fairly, uniformly enforce its rules is a corrupt government. No one should be exempt from rules. I mean, we make those by majority rule. That's the whole point of our government. And if you're on the not winning side, you're still obliged to follow those rules. And unfortunately, we want to excuse people from following the rules. The most egregious examples are rich people who don't follow rules or powerful people who don't follow rules. But there are other people we desperately seek to find a way to excuse them from, from following the rules. And we should not do that that makes a corrupt government. Westminster should not be a corrupt government. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and I appreciate the comments of my uh, fellow councillor and Mayor Pro Tem. Um, to, I, to address the homeless issue that we had a discussion with about last week, and I really encourage everyone to uh, go listen to that. It, um, for those listening or those who will listen later. Well, if you're listening later, you know where the link is. So, um, but if you're not sure how to get there, uh, cityofwestminster.us, click on the government bu button, click on the city council box, and then scroll down to meeting webcasts and they're all available there going back quite some time. Um, but last Monday, I thought we had a very robust discussion. Um, we had a great deal of information provided to us that was very helpful in that discussion. So I wanted to help staff on that too is, um, we, we need to recognize the fact that the city of Westminster was one of the first cities in, uh, on the west side of town to have their own navigator. Some of our uh, fellow cities uh, in Jefferson County were pooling resources to hire a navigator to split amongst them. And uh, uh, the past council recognized how important that was um, to our city and to those fellow humans that occupy in our city uh, in outdoors. But 
I think it was important that uh, those discussions that we had last week uh, cannot be encapsulized in, in a short comment period. But um, we, uh, I put forth a, 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 a premise of a continuum of, of compassion. And this is compassion for our fellow men in, in, in a way to, um, but then a continuum, a continuum that moved forward. Um, and so we already have a navigator in place. We talked about additional resources to add a navigator to offer those services that are available out there. Many though, that recognizably the city of Westminster cannot provide and we need our county partners to help with. That help is coming in different forms in Jefferson County and in Adams County. But as we heard from one of our speakers, the uh, open space at the, the controlled camping area at Regis is not even full and has not been the entire season. So there are resources available. It then becomes a choice. That choice then is what's next on the continuum after help is offered, after um, we put that through that process of being good, good citizens of the earth with our, our fellow human beings. But then we also owe our residents a duty and care of protection of our open spaces and of their safety. So at that point, then we move on to the next step and the next step and the next step. But we have to have time to have a, a, a defined, repeatable, multi-department and legally defensible strategy in place so that we can address this in each space that we come upon. So I ask our residents um, to be patient with this process. We have already made an incredible amount, staff did an amazing job this week. I wanna recognize that the mayor um, mentioned that uh, in our uh, opening session, and I'm sure she will again, but um, the movement is not just the Spanish Oaks. It is to the entire part of our city so that we can offer that continuum throughout the city. Um, and it, it is multifaceted from signs to navigators to assistance all the way to cleanup and restoration. So have patience with us. As one caller mentioned, we have to deal with legal ramifications as well. And I do not think our residents want us to spend their money in court. So um, thank you for that. And I appreciate the opportunity. I hope the members that left get a chance to listen back to that. Elsa Rizzotti. Thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of things. Um, one is I'm just really happy. Uh, so I know some of us may be angry right now, but I'm actually quite happy and hopeful because first of all, the fire department, that was an amazing presentation. And funny story, I was texting, um, I was emailing city manager, the interim city manager. And then I got a notice, a uh, text from, <laughs> from him. The group of us got a text from him uh, uh, on the end car fires, right? That was, I was literally asking about, hey, what are we doing with our fire mitigation plan? When, when is that coming up? I saw the agenda item and wanted to just get some more details. And then I got that notice and I deleted the email um, to folks so that we could focus on this. But amazing job tonight. And I'm looking forward to, that, to the post-meeting fire mitigation discussion. Um, but that's one thing I wanted to say. The second thing, I'm so hopeful and happy because council is right. Last week, the majority of us, we all agreed that homelessness is an issue. And we took steps to make sure that we have a holistic plan put into place, right? That That is humane. Um, I don't agree with some of the law and order piece of it, but I do understand from, you know, especially from the learnings that, that I've been talking about from the, the conference that I went to, um, we can't let, can't, we cannot let the encampments go on forever, but we also know that banning encampments don't, that doesn't work, right? Just getting rid of them does not work and that's nationwide. So last week, we, that continuum of care that Councilor Seymour is talking about, I'm very hopeful that that's the direction that council is moving towards. And I'm hopeful of hearing from all the um, public comments tonight um, because from the average of what I've heard was we need to make sure we shelter these people, that we enable engagement care, that we focus on mental health and all the various drivers of homelessness because simply banning and getting rid of them does not work. 
And I think that the public knows that. And that um, is very hopeful to me. So the third thing I wanted to talk about was, so Mayor Pro Tem is talking about me. <laughs> I'm the guy who doesn't like to vote by email. Um, I have a lot of reasons for that. And I, I wanted to actually read you guys the protocol that we're talking about here. So council, we have what's called lobbying protocols. And we even had it printed out for us so we can remind ourselves. Um, there's two issues I have with this. The, so let me just read the, the key pieces of it that I think are most important here. Um, so basically, throughout legislative session, the city takes official positions in support of or in opposition to proposed legislation, right? It's important that policy issues be reviewed with city council to ensure that they are priorities of the city. Prior to stating any official city position, staff will review the legislation to determine potential impact on the city. After thorough review, staff will provide city council with a brief summary of the legislation and a recommendation. I don't know about my colleagues, but I don't remember seeing this detailed summarized version and recommendations and analysis before we're asked to make a vote. That's one thing. Um, the second thing here is regardless of, the, of, the, of how legal it is, regardless of what protocols we may have in place, I believe transparency transcends legality. I think transparency means going above and beyond what is legal. That to me is the definition of transparency. Not let's walk up to the line of legal and stop there. We, this is a new council. We, we were elected by people to represent their best interest. And I, and I know all of you talked to a lot of the same people that I did. None of them want us to vote by email. Voting by email on any policy related issue, any budget related issue is not right. And that's a life principle that I stand by in terms of transparency. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes, I forget what it says. It says, um, information is the currency of democracy. I think that was Jefferson, right? That's a quote that we need to hold true. And, ha and we have this opportunity to make this little change. It's a little change to just say, hey, let's get, you know, one solution to this is let's be more proactive. Let's have staff and our lobbyists look at the bills. So I know we, 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 we won't have all, all the bills up front, but there's a lot of it that is up front that we can say, oh, we will probably ask council for their position on these 20 bills. And then we can actually have it in a public forum, have, give people the respect and the dignity to hear us give our positions to deliberate. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'm, I'm, you know, I don't like being the only one, but I don't mind being the only one if it's something that I believe in and something that the people believe in. Um, so that's why I don't vote by email and I would love us to stop doing it. Uh, Councillor Emmons. Thank you. Uh, lots been said, so in the interest of time, um, I, I believe in the continuum of uh, compassion in, de in developing viable solutions to uh, addressing our homeless uh, in Westminster. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll move on from that. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a town hall coming up on March 31st, which is this Thursday at 7 p.m. at Westview Rec Center. Uh, and then also to the point uh, for the study session that was last week, uh, Mr. Farb, I agree with you. Uh, it was not posted, or if it was posted, somehow it got lost. Um, the link got broken. I went to go find it today and it was not there but I'm assured by the city manager that it uh, was an un unfortunate oversight and it is now posted. So uh, for those that are uh, wanting to go listen to the study session, it should now be posted. So um, in moving on uh, to protocols, uh, I also was one to second and bring forward a reminder on protocols on what we all agree to um, <laughs> transparency is the goal of the council and it is in our strategic plan, uh, but it can also be misconstrued often. And um, this, these protocols are probably one of the only things that council must agree on 100%. Uh, it is not something that 
Uh, it is a majority. It is something that we agree to as a body, all seven of us. And so um, I just wanted to point out that what was agreed to in our lobbying protocols, and I, I agree that these uh, should be in the minutes, but for the purpose of the record, I want to read into the record. Um, if In case anybody misses it uh, through reading through our lovely minutes, is uh, that the official positions on specific bills frequently have time sensitivity, which means that the state legislature sometimes moves quickly than when we meet as a body on a, on a council on a weekly basis. Actually, um, even as a formal vote every other week, so even two weeks. So bills are moving fast at the state legislature and we don't have an opportunity to reconvene for at least two weeks to even provide any kind of public input. And so in our lobbying protocols, it says, as, as staff noted above, staff will review the legislation, summarize the issue and provide city council with a recommendation. It is very important that city council respond with their position via email to staff as quickly as possible in order for the city to allow as much impact as, as possible uh, on this piece of, on any piece of legislation. Once city council takes an official position on a bill or issue, the city legislative scorecard will be updated and made available to legislators and the public. So any time that we provide any kind of, and I hate to say voting because it's not voting. We are not an official voting body until we get on this dais. Um, when we are, uh, when we have these emails, we are taking a poll. We are sending an individual email to the person who sends us an inquiry that says, what is the city's stance on this? And then we individually respond and then they assume all of the polling votes, polling numbers to say the city then takes or does not take a, a stand on whatever issue comes forward. And in that regard, the it was agreed to that this that that council's polling would then be identified on who was for and who was against it. And so this gives the city an opportunity to be part of legislation that matters within our state. Same with at the federal level. So there is no uh, there's no voting behind the scenes. Um, and so I, I, I get very um, anxious and very agitated when it comes up because um, I am one to try and follow the rules as much as possible. Well, I agree that there's somewhat wiggle room on, on what needs to be done. Um, I think that we need to make sure that we're standing forward and that we are following the protocols that we as a council body have put forward. Um, that's all my comments tonight. So we can get to our agenda. Thank you. Councilor Namella. Thank you. Um, just on that note, um, it, uh, one, um, sometimes these polls, they do come very quickly and I, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to uh, feel like we have enough information to make a, a good decision on the polling. Um, the, uh, so in an ideal state, it would be great if we could, you know, if there's time, discuss these um, and ask questions of staff. Um, but that's, uh, you know, I'm happy to go along with the rest of, um, or the majority of council on just on this piece. It's just, if there is time, I, you know, it would be great to be able to um, spend it and get the opportunity to ask questions or to clarify things um, and to have transparency when there is the opportunity to have it. The question I would have is for us, do we, when we do these polls, um, do we post it anywhere? We do. We're so we put it on our website. Or could we, you know, that that might be in your so far out. this year, I've just come to the dais and told what we if we've done something, I've said it during comment. Um well it could be more transparent if we do just list those um, as part of, I guess, if you're having it in the minutes, um, in the council minutes, but I don't know if we get really enough detail. Um, so anyway, I, uh, um, all right, I will, I will 
keep going um, I, because I wasn't going to actually comment on that in particular. Um, although I do, I do support us trying to have more transparency in in these conversations. Um, the the real reason I wanted to talk was I did miss last week's meeting study session on um, on homelessness and what we were doing. So I am sorry to have missed that. Um, and catching up on, <laughs> as time permits, on, on the conversation. But I just want to address, and maybe uh, uh, the, the rest of my colleagues just encourage us to think of um, the, this continuum. It goes beyond just addressing the homelessness condition and where we and what we do to pull someone out of of that of that situation and experience. It's really about our housing costs, our rent increases that occur in the community. Um, there, it's about wages. It's about folks having the opportunity to build wealth in our community and to create jobs and to access jobs and education and training. And so we should be broadening this continuum to think about how did they get there and, um, and, and think about ways that we can address that. And that is through supportive and affordable housing and through addressing rent um, increases and through addressing the, the wage levels that we have in the community. So I just want to, and the types of jobs that we have available in the community. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do together to, um, to uh, ensure that folks don't end up in the situation where they are right now. And I think part of that is definitely recovery from the pandemic, but it's <laughs> recovery from our, bo our booming economy as well. So thanks. Councilor Emmons. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to note that uh, the legislative action is under city council, under the legislative action web tab, and it has at the bottom city of Westminster bill tracker, and it lists all of the bills for currently, we have two right now, um, that we have pulled on and it's public. The only thing I don't see um, and that I thought we were doing, but um, maybe we can get it on on this, but uh, it doesn't have who listed, who was listed as an opposer for. So um, maybe something that could be added to this, but it is on the website. If anyone wants to go see what Westminster is um, opposing or supporting, um, and then also we do, it hasn't happened yet, uh, but well, actually it has happened um, the last two meetings is that uh, we typically have a legislative review. We had one last week um, in our study session that has upcoming uh, items and bills. Uh, and that's our chance to then weigh in on what's coming forward. So that's, that's one of the items, um, but staff will bring it forward again, I believe in the fall too. Um, kind of tracking into what might be on the horizon for the next week. I just want to one more time publicly say to our acting city manager, and I saw him, did he, is he gone? Um, Larry Dorr, um, he, he took over while our city manager, um, Jody Andrews, took a break and had fun on spring break with kids and Larry was there in the midst of this um, city manager search. We are getting ready um, to ask for um, voices from, from our employees. And we have given names to the search firm of individuals and businesses and, and they hit the ground running. Their contracts on tonight's agenda and they've been working for two solid weeks non-stop with us. So um, I felt like um, I used to work for Walt Imhoff and, and he started his business with, you go to lunch, you write the agreement on a napkin and it was good. And I feel like um, our management partners ha have done that for us. So I, I want to say thanks, but Mr. Dorr has just been there to support me. He, I need something because we are policymakers. We don't do the everyday work. And, and he was there. I don't think he probably touched one thing he should have been working on last week, but he was in the trenches writing us um, emails of what was going on. 
at the camp after our um, study session last week. He was there several times. Many of you were there. Parks and Rec were there. Um, you came together. You heard what we all said a week ago. And as of 7 o'clock, we had all of the tents out of that area. We heard that there's one back. But it was a slow process, sort of, because we did have the navigator. If the navigator sees it's a veteran, that opens different doors than the person that maybe has family. And it opens different doors than somebody that has drug addiction. So they're the ones that build that trust, find out about the person, and then start figuring out where's the best place. And there's research that shows if you can get them into these places, they won't be coming back. So it's not that we can do it and just say, you're gone, that no one said that on this dais. And, and Mr. Doar took it over. I know um, City Manager Andrews, you're going to continue. It's a good team that is working for, for the good of the people that have property. Um, our, listen, today I dug into our trail and open space systems. And I learned a whole lot about why we don't want people living there. Not just because it's an open space. It, there's reasons we had open space and and it was a great read, but you can go read for yourself. Um, it's getting late and we haven't even started our meeting. Um, but the one thing I can say, and I wish our folks were still sitting here, um, it is not our police officers, it is not firefighters that are running to places and they see things. We need every citizen in this city to have eyes and ears on graffiti and homelessness. If you don't like it and you want to help have a clean city and one that is good and prosperous and helps people thrive, then you need to report it and you contact any one of us, we will get it to the right staff that's going to work on it all day long. But if you want to call it in or uh, with graffiti, the police have a great um, app. Go get it because on the once you open it, on the right hand upper corner, there's a little phone. If you click on that, it will give you all of the people that you can call for graffiti, you get on that voicemail and I guarantee you it's much quicker than the Access Westminster, which I sometimes wait two weeks to get told, oh, it's been taken care of. And I go, what did I even report? But with the phone and you can do the um, voicemail, it's gone in 24 hours to 48 hours. So I, we need your eyes and ears. We, we can't do it alone. The police force can't do it alone and the firefighters can't do anything alone. It is every single double eyes in this community to report and it's your responsibility to report it if you don't like it then report it and even if you do love it report it because we don't want we don't want graffiti it's it's just growing and it, it's awful so we're going to take a uh, break and be back at 9:35 
So All right, let's move the last three of these. We are back, and do I have a uh, motion for c consent agenda item 8A? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt consent agenda items 8A. Do I have a second? Second. It's moved, been moved and seconded to approve consent agenda item 8A, excess workers' compensation insurance purchase. Is there any questions or comments? Councilor Azadi. Thank you, Mayor. I do have some questions on this. Um, and I look to Councillor Seymour, probably for some expertise here. The first question I have is, uh, is that 4.9% part of the 17% number? So, sorry, I don't have it opened up. One second. Mayor, while uh, Councilor Azadi is finding that question, um, Marty Erickson has joined us at the uh, podium. She is our interim director of human resources. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to do that. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, so it says that the premium rate increase of 4.9% is in addition to the increases in payroll. Does that mean, so that's 17, so the total increase in premium of 17%, that $20,000 number? Is that 4.9% a piece of that 17%? Yes. yes. So that means the remainder is payroll increase? Yeah. So the 4.9% was pure premium increase to the uh, premium rate, the insurance rate. And the rest of that was due to payroll increases. Yes. How much is in the self-insurance fund currently? Oh, um, it's been a while since I've checked, but last time I checked, we were... I believe roughly around six, seven million dollars, somewhere in there. Is that in the reserves? Is that good or bad? <laughs> well, um, given the increases to our self-insured retention limits that you saw in the memo, um, I would like to see a little more in the reserve funds. The rule of thumb usually is to have ten times your SIR in your reserves. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, thanks for that. That makes sense. Um, last question. So it says that we've been with Midwest for 17 years. Yes. What did we pay them last year? Uh, as far as their fee? Yeah, the, their fee. It's uh, been $9,500 flat fee since I think 2012. They haven't increased that on us for some time. The, this total impact of 141000 in expenditures? I'm sorry? So it says that the fiscal impact is 141,000 to Westminster for this. Um, 
Yes. Sorry. Yes, that is the total amount of the premium. Has that increased year over year? Is this? Yes. But that's the amount we're paying to Midwest, correct? Correct. That includes the $9,500 that goes to the broker, IMA. Okay. I'm sorry. I think I confused those two for you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I see no other questions. Um, this is a voice vote. All those, oh no, sorry, it's a roll call. <laughs> Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill number 16, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill number 16 on first reading, providing it for a supplemental appropriation. Of funds to the 2021 year uh, budget of the general utility enterprise water and wastewater utility capital project reserve golf course enterprise legacy ridge fleet maintenance parks open space and trails general capital outlay replacement general capital improvement funds uh, councillor emmons second it's been moved and seconded to pass councillors bill number 16. is there any further discussion roll call please mayor pro tem demont yes Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to resolution number 13, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt resolution number 13, authorizing staff to prepare an intergovernmental agreement with the Colorado Department of Transportation with the intention to devolve and abandon a portion of the Sheridan Boulevard to the city of Westminster. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's resolution number 13. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm just curious, there was a caller on this specific item around the signage portion of, of this responsibility. Is that something that will take on responsibility or CDOT remain the ones who take care of that? see Mr. Downing is going to tell us. <laughs> uh, Dave Downing, Community Development Director. Um, Mr. Uh, Seth Plass, our, uh, one of our senior uh, civil engineers, is listening in. And he texted me earlier tonight to advise council that CDOT, even prior to the devolution item coming to the forefront, CDOT has reviewed and approved signage for the underpass project and the uh, the roadway widening project through that stretch. And uh, it's CDOT's intent to keep the road signage consistent with what's ex existing. So what I understand stood Mr. Carpenter to say was, I think what I heard was, be sure that people driving along US 36 know that it's not just the exit for Sheridan Boulevard, but for Colorado State Highway 95. So this seems to indicate that that indeed is, will be the case. Great, thank you very much. Yes. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 7-0 vote. That brings us to item C1, receive an update on on the use of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Community Development Block Grant. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you, Mayor. I move to receive an update on the use of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Community Development Block Grant COVID-19 response funding to prepare, prevent, and respond to the impacts of COVID-19. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass count, uh, item C1. Is there any further discussion? And there's nothing here. Is it a roll call or voice? I don't think there was actually a motion needed. Okay. It was just a, we just there's a presentation. It. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, that brings us to C2. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt resolution number 14 to assign the remaining balance of $44,702.83. Community Development Block Grant COVID-19 funds to Almost Home, Inc. to continue their efforts to provide eviction prevention support to assist qualified Westminster residents impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic. Mayor Pro, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Councillor Emmons. 
Uh, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Council's bill number 14. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Oh, oh sorry. That's okay. Um, just quickly wanted to point out if you don't, you know, you're not putting the, the dots together. We've talked a lot tonight about homelessness and the things that the city can do. Understanding a lot of this is, you know, county and state funds, but this is an opportunity that council, uh, since prior to this council being seated and those of us that were here when COVID-19 pandemic started, um, that we've tried to take advantage of these kind of programs so that we can help the people in the community to assure that they don't experience homelessness. And so this is a continued effort um, that is part of that continuum that we're going to continue to talk about as we address this issue. Roll call, please. Councilor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councilor Nermella. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. And Councilor Emmons. Yes. The motion passes on the 7 0 vote. That brings us to resolution 15, Mayor Pro Tem. Move to adopt resolution number 15, authorizing the mayor to execute and approve a contract with management partners for services related to the recruitment and selection of a city manager. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's or resolution number 15. Is there any further discussion? And I just publicly want to thank them for trusting we were going to pass this tonight. Um, roll call, please. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councilor Nermella. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Azadi. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item 10E, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, sorry. Councillor Seymour. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> Move to authorize the interim city manager to execute and amend a contract with Terra Care Associates LLC to continue snow removal through May 2022, as well as the maintenance of city owned landscaped areas, vacant lots, and infrastructure in areas of downtown Westminster for the remainder of the year. That would add $208,000 to the existing 2022 contract amount of $240,000 and authorize a project contingency of $31,200 for a total authorized expenditure with this firm not to exceed $479,200. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor, or to pass item 10E. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Seymour? Oh, oh that's okay. Roll call. Councilor Nermella. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Azadi. Yes. And Mayor McNally. Yes. The motion passes on this. I'm sorry. No, that's right. It, the motion <laughs> passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item 10F, Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Mayor. Move based on the recommendation of the interim city manager to determine the public interest will be best served by authorizing the interim city manager to execute a negotiated contract with Murray Smith, Inc., in the amount of $52,907 plus a city contingency of $7,500 for a total authorized expenditure of $60,407 to provide engineering design services for repairing a water main break located near the intersection of 112th Avenue and Federal Boulevard. Councilor Emmons, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass um, item 10F. Is there any further discussion? Yeah. Councilor Baker. Yeah, I'd like to delve in this a little more because I read the thing it said that we have had this pipe leaking since May of last year. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, can you give us um, Yes, this pipe has been leaking for a long time. And our utility operations crews went about trying to locate the leak and fix it themselves. And they were unable to access it, as explained in the agenda memo. It's inside a casing pipe, so there's a pipe within a pipe. It's in the middle of the intersection of 112th and Federal. They can't get to it. So we um, we contracted with a design engineering firm who specializes in repairs of this type. The good news is after they inspected it, they determined that they could find a, a repair that did not require digging up the intersection. They can line the pipe using a special lining system. It's a far more inexpensive, less disruptive way than doing an open cut. It's also a really important pipe. Um, right now, we can 
we can feed the demand that North Westminster requires. If we have another break in the line that feeds that area, um, our customers are going to know it and their service is going to be interrupted. So we really want to give this attention it needs. Do we know what kind of a break it is or were we unable to define that? So in the agenda memo, you'll find it talks about the condition of the pipe inside the casing pipe and what actually it may, actually it may be in background information as I think about it, but um, the condition of the pipe suggests that there's a portion of it within the casing pipe that's just deteriorating. Lining material can be structural. It can actually provide a structural support to the pipe that still remains there. In this case, effectively kind of functioning as a PVC pipe. So that is how, that's how sturdy that, uh, that lining is. Okay. How did we end up with this pipe in the casing pipe? Um, there, there are times when it's really a good idea to do that. Um, in certain intersections, if it's underneath another major utility, the reason we do that, <clears throat> we'll do it, for example, you're going to see pipes inside of casing pipes underneath railroads. If a pipe breaks underneath a railroad or underneath an irrigation canal, um, the rail tra road track can cave in. Um, you can get a break in the wall of an of a irrigation canal and water's just gonna keep going. Um, <clears throat> if it's inside a casing pipe, what it does is it breaks inside, the water's gonna go to the end of the casing pipe and that's where it's gonna seep out. And we make sure the casing pipe is long enough that it reaches an area where it's not going to have that catastrophic effect, for example, damage the railroad line or cause an irrigation canal to fail. So in other words, it adds to the structural uh, uh, really resistance of the pipe. I know there's like schedule 40 pipe and schedule 80 and schedule 80 is stronger and take more downward pressure. I mean, it's, it's a, it, it gives you, it sends that water to get somewhere else to go in case that pipe breaks. Because you can't really So it doesn't the erode the street away. Right. Because that's what it would do. Right. How much water are we losing? And where's it going? Um, it's going out the end of the pipe and I, it's, it's probably leaking in the right of way because that's what a, a right of, a casing pipe would do in this case. You wouldn't want it to come up in the middle of the road. Um, I, I don't have a measure on how much water is lost. It's a 12 inch pipe that's leaking. Um, but what they've done is they've shut it off. So the leak has ceased and they shut it off because it wouldn't be reasonable. It doesn't do any good. It only does harm to let it continue to leak. Um, and in doing so, we're also, we don't have a robust uh, distribution system feeding the north part of the city. It is sufficient, but there's no room for more breaks without people really noticing it. So obviously we have other 12 inch or 16 or 24 inch supply of pipes feeding the north. That's right. And that's typically the case where we have to build reliability into the distribution system because things do go wrong. And it's been shut off then for almost a year? Quite a while, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Seymour, did you have something? Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councillor Nirmella. Yes. The motion passed on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item um, 10G. Councillor Emmons. I move based on the recommendations of the interim city manager to determine that the public interest is best served by authorizing the interim city manager to execute a negotiated contract with PCL Construction Incorporated in the amount of $123,000 for construction management at risk, pre-construction phase services for the North Ridge Water Tanks Replacement Project and authorize a contingency in the amount of $12,000 for a total authorized expenditure of $135,000. Councillor Seymour? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve 
um, item 10G. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Baker. Yes, I have uh, several questions on this one. Uh, in the really proposal fee, Stanick of the constructors bid $32,100 and PCL bid $112,000. And yet in the thing, it says PCL bid $123,000. How did it go from 112 to 123? Oh, okay. Um, we added $11,000. That was intentional. The reason we did that is um, because we identified other parts of the infrastructure that are likely going to get replaced. So there's yard piping, their valves, they're about as old as the tank itself. And as old as it is, there's a good chance that some of that piping is asbestos pipe. When a contractor knows ahead of time that they're gonna run into asbestos pipe, we get better prices than when they find out after the fact. It's a good idea to spend that $11,000 to confirm what, what needs replacing in yard piping and if there's any asbestos there, because in the long run, we'll end up spending more if we don't know that. Okay. Uh, this was uh, one on uh, the best value uh, criteria. So the price is a dramatic difference, a low bidder of 32,000 versus 100 and, well, we use 112. Uh, help me understand how you came to this best value because I looked into the reputation of Stanic Construction, they seem to be a very experienced, knowledgeable, competent company. Stanic is a very experienced, knowledgeable, competent company. And there are times when we get proposals from very experienced, knowledgeable, competent companies, and we reject their bids for good reason. In this case, if you look at the hours that are listed in the agenda memo, Stanic listed 428 hours. The other firms ranged from 826 to 1,287. The, the review team determined that 428 hours is just not enough to do the kind of job that the RFP requested of the, of the contractor. Um, it's also true that they, from their proposal, they did not seem to have the same level of experience constructing these kind of tanks in Colorado. In that case, I expect them to have a few more hours, not substantially less. So they're almost, they're almost half of what PCL is. And PCL was the next lowest fee. We felt that fee was responsive. Stanix was rejected. It was not enough hours. This is all for pre-construction work where you identify potential problems that might crop up because this will then become a design bid contract, correct? It will not be a design. This will be a C, continue to be a CMAR contract. And so, I, so what I think you're getting at is, are these, is this consultant going to get the opportunity to, to get the design, to get the CMAR contract for construction? The advantage, first of all, the reason we do this is not to give an advantage to a contractor. It's to the city's benefit. And the reason it's to the city's benefit is because when the design engineer and the contractor collaborate on a project that's kind of unique, this is a unique tank project, pre-stressed concrete, thinner walls, and a lot of concrete um, uh, tanks are cheaper but also uh, more complex. When they do that, we, we get better prices and we get a better idea of when those materials are gonna be available. And that when we get that, we, we don't get surprised like you might get in a design bid build contract. So we have better information upfront. It also allows us to look at the pricing that the contractor has. So when you get a bid, design, bid, build, 
you don't really see that until the day you open the bids and you don't have the information to really know well, how much are they making? But when you can see the cost of the materials, as you can with Seymour, they give you a guaranteed maximum price. If we don't like it, if we don't think it's competitive enough, not just we, the city, but also the engineer evaluating it, because that's part of their job, we will send it out to bid. So there's no guarantee that they'll get it. Well, I mean, that was the other troubling thing because you have a lot of information included here and it went way beyond the pre-construction thing. It looked to me that it was seamlessly into the, con into the construction. And isn't that where the big, the big money is? Because I read it that it's 9% and we estimate these tanks to be $16 million for the two of them. We, what the engineers scoped to do, we want the contractor to back that up with the information they have. So what the engineers scoped is what makes the most sense for this project and for us to know upfront and pre-design so we can put together, so we can have put together a better, a better project for construction, better, better bid documents. The contractor isn't necessarily going to do all the work either. CMAR contractors, um, oftentimes it's very specialized work. They will send some of that work out to bid. So thank you. <laughs> I think you were directing me. Okay, would you define so that, would you define what CMAR is, please? Um, construction manager at risk. That's what that stands for. It's a type of contract. Um, the engineer is contracted with us, and there is more detailed information on prices available to the city and a bit available to the engineer to review so that we can plainly see what, what we are paying for. I thought that was the whole point of the, of like this pre-construction contract. So you would get a very good idea of what a valid maximum price would be, because this is all a maximum price contract and the at-risk contractor is the one who says, I will do it this much tops, even if it costs them a million more. Right? I don't understand that. I don't understand what you're saying. This will be, this is a design and build contract. It will become a design and build contract with a guaranteed maximum price. There is such a thing as a design build contract. This is a CMAR contract. It is not a design build contract. There are differences between those two contracts. I probably couldn't give you a real detailed um, distinction just off the top of my head, but this is a CMAR contract and the risks associated and the information that we have on material costs and on overhead and on change orders is much more concrete than it is on any other contract. Okay, does it have a maximum price? It has a guaranteed maximum price. So I get back to the original question. What about Stanick? Besides, he thought he could do it for far fewer hours. Did you not like about that? When we look at, at, at a bid, what we look at is the work we've laid out in front of the contractor to do, the hours and the hours that they're proposing and the qualifications of their team. There are four proposals we got. Of the four proposals, three of them aligned. One of them didn't. The one that didn't had substantially less hours. Was there any other criteria besides the substantially less hours? The only thing, other thing that's mentioned in, in the agenda memo is that they didn't have the same level of experience um, doing tanks in Colorado. So that did not help them. Um, but the hours, the hours are, are linked to the fee. And, and we've that, done that was insufficient. 
And we've done at least three of these concrete tanks, right? Well, three that I know of, the one here at City Hall and the two up on Gregory Hill. Right, and we've we've done the other one at Hydro Pillar. There's another tank. They're different tanks. I, I wouldn't say they're all identical, but I, I don't know that that really makes a difference. It's entirely possible that some of those others had, had um, I, I don't know the history of them, but I can't tell you when and when not we have tanks that, or, or any contract. If there's a contract where what the contractor is submitting does not meet um, the work that's described because it doesn't allot enough hours. It just is. Okay, thank you. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nurmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to item 10H. Councillor Emmons. Move to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Lighting Accessory and Warning Systems LLC for $400,000 for the purchase and installation of emergency equipment, lighting, and graphics for city vehicles. This contract is renewable for up to four additional one-year periods. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve a, a pass note item 10H. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. It is 10 08, and I will adjourn this meeting and we will go, move into the WIDA agenda, incorporating the roll call of the past meeting. And do I have a motion to approve the minutes? of the February 14th, 2022 meeting. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to approve the minutes of the February 14th, 2022 meeting as presented. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 14th, 2022. Um, any questions, comments? Mayor Seymour or <laughs> Councillor Seymour. <laughs> I reject that. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to our public hearing for our WIDA. Um, and I, it is now 10.09 and I open that public hearing. If there's anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to us about our WIDA agenda item um, for resolution number 218, please come forward. Seeing no one, I close the hearing at 10.09 and a move to adopt resolution 218. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to adopt resolution number 218, authorizing a supplemental appropriation to 2021 Westminster Economic Development Authority budget. Board Member Evans. A second. Been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 218. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Baker. Yes, I'd like an explanation of the carryover of the North Huron revenues. Good evening, Larry Dora, Chief Financial Officer of the City and uh, Acting Treasurer of the Economic Development Authority. The North Huron area uh, tax increment, we are very conservative in our revenue projections. Um, there have been reassessments that uh, those change. Also, we're undertaking some projects. Those are, are in progress, those capital projects. So these are routine carryovers of either excess revenues or underspending and so forth that will add to the reserve of that particular economic uh, development area. So again, uh, fourth quarter uh, excess revenues were very conservative in our pro projections and what passes through the uh, Urban Renewal uh, Authority. Well, if I'm reading this correctly, it says the excess revenues were negative six million dollars. Um, no, I think. Uh, well, I beg your pardon here. I'm just going to skim my notes and uh, try to orient to that uh, to the comment from uh, our administrator in the finance department. Uh, and I may need to provide a follow-up bit of information if I'm not familiar with that as I got uh, oriented to it. I. 
don't know if we were making a supplemental or expecting a receipt that was not received uh, that came in different. So I'm afraid I'll have to provide a follow-up uh, response in the future to this uh, um, to this uh, supplemental. Is it very common to have negative carryovers? Because generally carryovers are excess. Yes, I, I beg your pardon, and I don't. I don't know if it's expressed that way, either as a debit or a credit, or if those are the exact words that are presented. I'm sorry, I don't see that in the staff report, and I'll have to, again, I'll have to follow up. Okay. But no, that wouldn't be typical. We would usually have, again, carryover being excess revenues or uh, shortfall in uh, okay. spending. My next two questions are on the expense side, and they're the WERP City Particip Participation CIP and the WERP WERP CIP reserve. There's almost, uh, well, $570,000 there. Where did this money come from? Is this from the sale of parcel A or part of parcel A? Yes, this is, uh, we had the sale of part, I think it's A4, if, yeah. if I'm reading that correctly. And yes, uh, then there was a, a change in the uh, book value of the property as well. That's, a, that's an adjustment to uh, the books for uh, the urban renewal area for that particular parcel now that uh, the character of it's changed. So, yes. And so the money going into the reserve really is in a sense savings, isn't it? Uh, in this particular piece, I, you know, I think we're writing down an asset. This isn't a cash, uh, cash transaction related to this, that particular entry. But isn't this, $199,000 we're getting, we're going to spend. Oh, and I see as a write down because we evaluated the property. It changed the character of it through the platting, as I'm reading the, the notes here. And uh, yeah, not not unusual. So, for, so we had really valued the property at $700,000. So when we sold it for $500,000, we lost $200,000. And that's what this expense is. That's booking that change. Okay. And then the 372, did we add, then we spent more money as our participation in whatever capital improvement project we were doing there? Yeah, I, I think I'm reading this related to the rent and common area maintenance that, that occurred, uh, the 372. Is that the number that you're referring to? Yeah, but that also? says participation CIP, isn't it? CIP capital improvement project? It would be. So how could it be common area maintenance? I beg your pardon. I think I was reading a different line item. Um, I, I apologize. So I'll have to, I'll have to provide a follow up on that as well. Thank you, thank you. Councilor Emmons. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Director Dor. I want to direct your attention to maybe help clarify Councilor Baker's oh. question on the six million. It's listed in the uh, table of revenues and in parentheses it says six million sixty five thousand seven hundred seventy nine as far as the current budget is that what you were as far as a deficit yeah I, I am also seeing that in the schedule one page one and i noticed that there's just the the adjustment in the appropriation is just a slight change uh, but i don't know the cause of the original budget or what that uh, differential is. I'll have to, I'll have to provide a follow-up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Roll call, please. <laughs> Board member Baker. Oh. Vice chair DeMott. Yes. Uh, Board member Emmons. Yes. Board member Azadi. Yes. Uh, chair McNally. Yes. Board member Nermella. Yes. And board member Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. That concludes, um, it's 10-16 and um, I will adjourn this meeting and we will head into post meetings uh, in the other room. And we do have cause for an executive session. Do you want to put that on record before we leave? Yes, Mayor, if we could. The exec session that's proposed for the concluding uh, item on tonight's agenda is to discuss strategy and progress on a proposed economic development agreement involving an expanding pharmaceutical company in which the disclosure of information such as financial data or proposed incentives would have made public seriously jeopardize the city's ability to secure the development.
pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 246402, or E1, and Westminster Municipal Code 1113C4. I will poll council to make sure you want to go into executive session and we'll hold whatever's said there confidentially. Councillor Izzati? Yes. Councillor Numella? Yes. Councillor or Mayor Potem? Yep. I'm a yes. Uh, Councillor Emmons? Yes. Councillor Seymour? Yes. Councillor Baker? Yes. And um, we'll have um, Mr. Uh, City Manager Andrews do it inside when we're on tape. So we are adjourned and we will meet to have our next two meetings and then uh, an executive session.
have to be here long enough Help like me. me. We are we are alive. Okay. okay. Uh, uh. It's 1024 and we are in uh, post meeting. The first piece is presentation of the streets division pavement management process. Hey, manager. Thank you, Mayor. I'll turn it uh, directly over to Sarah Borges, who will introduce the team tonight, um, and we'll begin the presentation. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, Sarah Borgers, Interim Public Works and Utilities Director. I am starting week three today. And well, so <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's been lovely. So I'm going to turn it directly over to the guy who knows a lot about this stuff, who I think can I can say has been working on this for decades now. Yeah, yeah. So I'll turn it directly over to Kurt Mewmeyer, our streets operations. Thank you, Ms. Borders, and uh, thank you, Mr. Andrews, um, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, um, Kurt Mulemeyer, Street Operations Manager. Um, I have a brief presentation for you this evening to talk about uh, payment management, street rehabil rehabilitation. As Mr. Andrews mentioned in his uh, comments this evening, uh, we kicked off street improvements very early this, this year um, today. And uh, what I would like to mention about that is that is 2021 carryover work. Um, some of you may remember, some of you may not. Uh, we had a very significant shortage of asphalt material last year, did not get a lot of work accomplished in 21. Uh, we are starting that work today and hopefully uh, have that accomplished, completed uh, by in, in the next month or two. Um, obviously weather's in place still, but uh, we're working diligently to get that work done. Um, so in addition to the work starting today, um, over the next two council meetings, uh, you, you're gonna see a common theme with um, street related items coming before you for your approval. Um, we thought it would be a great idea to kind of give you as much information as possible to help you make uh, informed decisions on each one of these items. Um, so with that, um, I will ask for the next slide, please. Uh, it might be difficult to see, but this is, uh, this is the citizen survey uh, that comes out every year, community survey. Uh, it's a good reminder for us, um, you know, just to summarize that, you know, that survey, 93% 93, 93 of the residents believe that uh, streets are um, of the highest importance. And conversely, 58% of the people that take the survey think that our roadways are less than good, um, which is kind of relates to what we'll get into with the survey, uh, condition survey. So if I could have the next slide, please. We talk a lot about PQI and as much as I dislike acronyms, uh, PQI is, is one that we talk about a lot and that is uh, short for Pavement Quality Index. Uh, pavement Quality Index is a culmination of all those things and the arrows that you see there. Um, we, we get to that number by doing a lot of very sophisticated testing uh, using various equipment. Um, you know, we, we find the surface distresses at uh, using a high speed vehicle that takes high, um, resolution images of our roadways as it drives the posted speed. In addition to that, um, we do thickness testing. They do that thickness testing by uh, ground penetrating radar, as well as core drilling to verify. Um, structural integrity testing is done by, by way of a um, falling weight deflectometer. Sorry, that's a, that's a mouthful for sure. Um, and that uh, smoothness test is done also at speed using a high speed profiler. So all of that information is collected on all of our roadways. And it's gone through a very sophisticated software program and it spits out PQI, which is a number between zero and 100, with zero being you know, completely failed section of pavement, 100 being absolutely perfect. Uh, and so now having that information, you can see where we're stacking up. And again, that graph, that graph on the right is, is difficult to see. Um, the silver color is the most recent survey. The orange color is uh, 2020 survey and the blue is 2019. And you can kind of see how the segments surveyed are starting to fall further to the left, which is bad. We, we want to keep as much to the right on that graph as possible, um, condition wise. And those numbers at the bottom, again, are hard to see, but um, the higher the number, the better the condition. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So it, this slide on the left here is kind of the fundamental pavement management philosophy that uh, many, many, many agencies employ throughout the, the country. And basically what that slide on the left is saying is that you get more benefit from spending money on lower cost preser preservation treatments, things like crack seal, seal coats, 
um, than you do out of waiting to a road completely deteriorates, fails at the bottom, and then trying to invest uh, in getting it back up to um, where you want it to be in a, in a good or excellent condition. Uh, that's what that slide means. Um, and you know, a moniker that is used in pavement management is you know, choosing the right treatment for the right road at the right time. Uh, and that's what that is saying, right? We, we wanna use the least amount of money to get the road in the best condition for the longest amount of time. Uh, and the chart to the right there, you can see some real world costs for us per lane mile. Um, and it, you know, those numbers may or may not be um, all that meaningful to you. So I, I always like to give real world examples. So everybody's familiar with 112th Avenue from Federal to Sheridan. Um, that route is approximately 9.5 lane miles, that segment. Uh, and to do crack seal on that road, it's gonna cost us around $12,000 to crack seal that road from end to end. Uh, pretty low cost really. And that's representative of that green area, right? We're gonna do that to a, a road that's in good condition, trying to seal moisture from getting into the, the layers and causing potholes and, and that kind of thing. Um, conversely, when you think about an overlay, right? An asphalt overlay where you're grinding the surface and you're putting a new riding surface. So at 9.5 lane miles, that's gonna cost us roughly $1.3 million. Um, and that's, again, using the costs that are in that chart there. And then, you know, that, that, that sounds like a big difference between crack seal and overlay. Um, but then the worst case scenario, when you get into the red area down there to reconstruct it, meaning take the pavement down to dirt and rebuild it from the ground up, um, that section of roadway would cost us $5 million. Um, and Further keep in mind that, you know, our average amount that we invest in our roadway maintenance program is $5.5 million annually. So, you know, if we had to reconstruct 112th Avenue, that would be our rehab program for a year. Uh, that would take all of our, all of our money to do that. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the chart on the left there details um, what we've invested and how many lane miles we have treated since 2017. Uh, you can kind of see, you know, how it how it has gone. 74 lane miles uh, in 2017. This year we're doing 89 lane miles. I do want to preface that in that that's also including the 2021 work that was not completed in 21. So that's why that number is is higher than normal. We do also have some additional funds um, in 2022, which is also helping keep that number higher than other years. Uh, the gray areas on that chart represent, you know, what we should be spending. Um, kind of a, you know, an industry standard is to treat 10% of your network. Um, our network is 1,135 lane miles. So considering that 10% would be 113 lane miles. We're doing 70, 60, 80, you know, we're doing about half of what we really should be doing. Um, and, in the agenda memo, um, there was also a section about some of the costs that we're incurring in 2022. And you can see the chart to the right is a, or the graph to the right, excuse me, is a ton of asphalt, one ton of asphalt. Um, it, it has hovered right around the $60, $65 mark since 2017. Um, we got what I would equate to sticker shock when we got our pricing for 2022. Um, contractors are really, really struggling with pricing this year. Um, some of that has to do with inflationary costs. Some of it has to do with um, the fluctuating oil costs. I mean, oil costs right now are really unpredictable. Um, and some of it just has to do with the, the market in Denver. Uh, labor, trucking are at an absolute premium. Uh, we were not anticipating costs ranging from 12 to 17% over 21 costs. Uh, that far exceeds anything that I've seen in my tenure um, doing this type of work. Um, and it, it certainly was not anticipated. So we have had to scale back some of our programs that were anticipated for 2022. You will start to see that in some of the agenda memos requesting contract approvals coming here over the next few weeks, few months. Um, and that's the reason why uh, these costs are, are much, much higher than we had anticipated. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Quick question. Sure. You mentioned 22, it's, you have additional funding. Where, what is that from, the source of that? So some of that is anticipated. Um, if you recall, um, 
the roadway improvement fee, formerly the infrastructure fee is kind of equated in there. Um, we, we did some, some work to include multifamily, charging them separately this year. I don't know that um, we really know for sure how much money that's generating, but I think there was an anticipation that more funding would be coming for that. Uh, we originally also had some ARPA funds that were slated to be included. Um, as I understand, those, those funds have been paused at the time being, uh, bearing a, a future discussion. So um, the other part of, of where that money comes from, I believe, is additional sales and use tax that is being directed our way. Another, another big um, contributor to our budget is the Adams County road tax. It seems like that money is, it, it has gone up. Everything has just kind of gone up. As the economy has kind of picked up post pandemic, we're starting to see an increase in those kind of uh, revenue sources. But have we gone up enough to cover the increase of your costs? Not even close. So we're still far behind. Very far behind. Even in 22. Yep, that's correct. Uh, so these two charts, so the chart on the left there would be the current pathway that we would say we're on given the amount that we're spending, right? And the, the amount is represented in the green bars. The line going downwards would be our overall PQI number. And as we continue to spend, that number continues to decline. And it, kind of status quo spending, the, the $5.5, $6 million, uh, we can safely anticipate based on our payment management program our PQI is going to be a 39 in five years at this current rate. Uh, it's just not sustainable. The inflationary costs really hurt us this year. Um, for those of you that recall uh, seeing my presentation previously, we, we estimate that our replacement costs for our street network are 600 million. That inflation costs have increased that $96 million. So I, I can now tell you our replacement costs for our roadways are almost 700 million. It went up in one year and you can you can kind of do the math in your head of what that means working backwards and you know the, the value of our dollar just doesn't get what we would like it to get um, and the chart on the right would be demonstrative of what we need just to maintain status quo right and, and what we're looking at is in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million per year spent on our roadways uh, if we can do that we can maintain our current pqi not even improve it just maintain it I can have the next slide, please. Good question. Please. That PQI, the our current state, how does that compare to other cities around this? So I actually, there is, a, the Colorado Asphalt Pavement Association puts out a survey every year of virtually every city up and down the front range. I don't have that with me, but I would love to get you a copy of that so you can see how Westminster stacks up. Um, I'll kind of spoil the surprise for you. We're average. We're not better, we're not worse. We're right in the middle. Uh, there's, there's places that are much worse and places that are much better. Thanks. Um, so pictures here, just a reminder, right? The picture on the left is preventative seal coating, or uh, excuse me, crack sealing. Picture on the right is the representative of an overlay, more of a rehabilitation. And then the picture on the right is, you know, full subgrade reconstruction, just, just for reference there. Um, and I believe that is the last slide that we have. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So there's my information. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, love the opportunity to, to get counsel out to see tours and see work being done and, and really kind of see and understand how all this stuff plays into the, the larger picture. So I'm happy to entertain any questions that uh, you may have at this time. Do you still do chip seal? We do chip seal in limited amounts. Um, I, Long story short, uh, the chip seal product is just not the same product that it was 10 years ago. It's not, it's not done to the same level of professionalism, in my opinion. Um, so we have geared away from that and have looked at other processes, uh, similarly priced and, and similar benefit. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if it, let's say we go back to um, the price of oil drops to a reasonable because that's a big driver on the asphalt um, in an average year, or let's say 2019-ish, if if we had a $11.6 million budget available, is there contracting capacity for that? That's a great question, Councillor Seymour. Um, I would say, I would say we, we, we don't know. I mean, obviously our staff is set up to manage $6 million. If you gave us $11 million, we definitely would struggle managing that. But there's other ways to do it. I mean, doing it with our own staff, probably not. 
we would have to outsource some of the contract management, some of the contract oversight, maybe to a consulting firm or, or somebody that we have worked with previously. So hopefully that answers your questions. It's a yes and no kind of answer there. Okay. Um, have we looked into, I, I've seen this, I've seen this in action in, in Arvada, well, other places too, but actually saw it in uh, asphalt recycling system where you're milling and recycling. I mean, you've got to have the raw oil and the products to put into that, but they're milling, recycling, and laying down on the backside. Is, is that a process that's cost effective? It can be. It can be. Uh, we have definitely used that process here. Um, that process can be used. Uh, I, I'm sorry to go back to what I said earlier, but it has to be used in the right location at the right time. Um, I would say we have experimented with that, maybe not at the right road at the right time, and it hasn't worked out. Uh, you really have to be very careful how you price those because um, a, a traditional mill and overlay and that process are almost the same cost. Uh, so you really have to figure out cost and benefit. Are you getting the same benefit or are you not? Yeah, I, I, yeah, because I would have thought it would be cheaper, but by the time you put all the system together, pay for that. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's correct. And and it's it's a it's a lengthy. I mean, time from mill to start. You can't do it on corners. You have to have long straight stretches of road. Too. Absolutely. You also have to be very cognizant of foliage in the area. Uh, they heat the pavement to very high temperatures. The heat radiates off the road and, and you can cause damage to trees, which we don't want to do. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Um, I've asked this question before and it might be pipe dream thinking, but I'm going to keep asking every year that I'm here. So there's a lot of things out on the internet, obviously, that are true and not true, but sure. like technology with like recycled um, material. I mean, obviously we recycle asphalt. I'm just curious if the industry is seeing any of that stuff start to come to fruition, especially understanding the you know challenges with costs around traditional asphalt. Are we starting to see any other kind of uh, market-driven products that might help us do something different that is more sustainable? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yes, I, I would say the market, the asphalt industry as a whole is very responsive and they want to be extremely environmentally responsible. And, and certainly part of that is, is having a product that can be renewable. Um, don't quote me on this, but there, there's a fact or a, a statement out there that says asphalt is, is one of, if not the most recycled material in the world. Um, everything that you see milled off and hauled in a truck gets taken to an asphalt plant and gets put back in asphalt and shipped back and put down. Uh, we currently in our standards allow for 25% of new hot mix asphalt to be comprised of recycled materials. I think there's more room and there's more growth in that area to do that. Um, I certainly understand with, um, you know, especially this year where you, oil prices have just skyrocketed and the asphalt cement prices have skyrocketed right on the back of having an asphalt shortage. I mean, it, it's, it's extremely frustrating to say the least for us. Um, but yeah, it, the more recycled material you can put in, the less amount of new asphalt you need to put into it. So I think there's technology um, and there's definitely a desire to find ways to become better at using less you know, crude oil in the process. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and I mean, I've just seen uh, like, you know, you see, especially in some European countries, they're starting to use different materials altogether. I don't know how feasible that is, like depending on your climate. Because I imagine some of those, like I've seen a lot of things that they're doing with recycled plastic from like houses to roads, how feasible that is. I have no idea, but I imagine at some point, you know, that might be something that, you know, is more feasible if they mix it in with asphalt or maybe even seen at playgrounds where they use the recycled yeah. plastic material. So. Just curious if that's really a mainstream thing or just, you know, wishful thinking. I have heard of plastics. I know there's there's a push right now to to look at incorporating the plastic bags from grocery stores and incorporate those into asphalt. And what does that do? Um, with a lot of things, you have to be careful what you put in there because for every action, there's a reaction uh, with the material. So I think they're in the process of kind of vetting that out. Is it viable? Is it not? If it is you know, great. If it can drive the price of asphalt down, that benefits all of us in the long run. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I seem to recall, and this was before I was on council, when the mall 
there was still a lot of asphalt. I mean, didn't the city like benefit from selling a lot of that material off at one point? I don't think we have any more big parking lots like that we own, but. Unfortunately not. Yeah, the, I mean, asphalt is really, whether it's on the road, it has a lot of value to it. Um, you almost don't see asphalt being, you know, milled up, ground up, just, you know, taken up in chunks and thrown away in a landfill anymore. There's too much value to that material, to the asphalt producers to take it, pulverize it, grind it up, put it back and sell it back to cities, counties, local governments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Baker. Uh, it's my understanding water is the biggest threat to the roads, which is why the crack seal program is so important. So how many lane miles of crack seal do you do a year? Geez, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Brock to help me out there. So lane miles of crack seal on average, we're about 18 to 20 lane miles a year. Um, th this year should be setting up to, to be the same way as that. If it's so preventative, why don't we do more? I, I will say that crack seal only gets you so much benefit. Um, yes, it seals the cracks. Yes, it prevents moisture. But money that you're spending on crack sealing is also money you're not spending on fixing the roads that are bad. Um, we, we always say we don't crack seal bad roads. We crack seal good roads. If you see our crews out crack sealing them, why would you? Right. It, you're just throwing money down the drain at that point. So I'd say there's also public pressure that we try and, and maintain a certain level of, you know, uh, quality roads. Uh, for instance, if 112th had completely failed and we spent a lot of money crack sealing other roads and not fixing 112th, I mean, that's, that's not a good public image to set. So we also try and balance that. We do a mixture of all rehabs, all strategies, including crack seal. But isn't crack seal twelve hundred dollars a lane mile? Where some asphalt overlay is a hundred thousand dollars a mile. And also to add to that, too, we may not have enough roads. If you saw that chart, the roads, the, the condition of our roads is starting to decline. Uh, there's not that many candidates for crack seal. A lot of these roads are falling into categories where we need to overlay, we need to patch, we need to. Um, you know, do something with the riding surface because they're rough. Crack seal does nothing to help you in, in rough road roadways. Right. Uh, and besides, because we have our own crack seal crew, right? We do some crack seal ourselves. We also contract some out. And we fill our own potholes, right? That is correct. But almost everything else we do is contracted by a contractor. Not necessarily. Um, we have the ability, um, Again, we have staffing issues as, as many people do, but we have the ability to do some overlays. Uh, we do a lot of utility patching um, when our utility crews have an excavation, we're the ones patching behind them. So we, we do some overlays, some patching. Uh, we have more capabilities than just crack sealing and filling up okay. uh, Those four inputs into the PQI, they can't all be equal, are they? Equal, no. Structural has to be like 80% of the road, right? Definitely. I'm making up numbers, but to give you the proportion. So really, there's there's three things that we would say would be equal, right? And you look at pavement thickness, subgrade, subgrade strength, and traffic volume. Those three components are what really drive the curve, right? How fast a road's going to go from great to terrible. Um, you know, and obviously we would love to have every road be super thick on a really strong subgrade and no traffic, right? Those roads would last forever. Um, but that's not, that's not reality. We have thick pavements, we have thin pavements, we have strong subgrades, we have weak subgrades. Um, so, but those are the three drivers, the three main components. Except those we all inherited. When whoever built the road, built the road, they decided on what the structural subgrade was going to be and how thick and, and they decided how much pavement they were going to put down, didn't they? True. And so it, there's nothing we can do to mitigate that. True. Except seal the crack. We, we can also, it also lets us know, like if you have a, a very thin pavement, right? You're certainly not going to try and grind off another layer and put another layer on top of that because the truck traffic, the traffic alone is going to destroy what's remaining. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, I know that uh, 
a heavy truck can cause in one trip what a thousand cars would cause to the road. There's actually a, a chart that shows that. Yep, yep. So I understand that part. But again, that's something we inherited from whoever built the road. And there's after the fact, there's nothing we can do to mitigate that, is there? Whenever you stack layers on top of layers, you're building strength, structural strength into a roadway. So I would say, no, we can do something about it. Except that most of our, all our roads uh, by however, however tall, you know, the uh, really concrete on either side of the road is, we can't really build over that, can we? So we will go in and, and grind down just the edge line. But on a thin road? Oh, you just grind down the edge, edge line, line and, and then stack ground. the center thicker. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how much of our roads then, uh, and a lot depends on traffic, but that's why we're thankful that federal's a state highway. State highway. Yes. All that, but we have other heavily traveled roads or trucks like Sheridan and stuff like that. And a lot of Sheridan is ours. Correct. But uh, hopefully that was built better. Yes. Okay. So what would you do if you had more money? What would you do with that money? So where we are lacking, where we really are not keeping up with where we should be is, um, you know, we go out and we fix roads. For instance, um, the Westbrook neighborhood, kind of 100th Avenue to the south. We overlaid every street in that neighborhood two years ago, right? The key thing to do there is three years after you've done that, go back, crack seal it, and put some type of a low-cost seal coat on top of that so that you're preserving what you've invested in. Um, we're not able to do that right now. Uh, we don't have the funds. <laughs> Sorry, Councilor Seymour. We don't have the ability to go in there and follow up and really do that aggressive, uh, preservation work that needs to be done and preserve the money that we've spent two, three, four, five, six years ago, because we're, we're constantly trying to keep up. But if the differential between an overlay and a crack seal is 50 to one, wouldn't it be better not to do one mile of overlay and do 50 miles of crack seal? Not necessarily. I mean, it, it's all dependent upon the condition of the roads you're looking at. I mean, it's, it's hard to say, you know, we could probably take all our money and crack seal every road in the city if we wanted to, but I'm not sure that's going to fix the issues that we have in certain places. It's gonna be great for some roads, but it's not gonna be good in other in other roads. It'd be money just thrown away, essentially. Yep. Anyone else? Obi? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, you mentioned that the, so the survey set shows that the, the, the people say this is a very important issue. I, I don't think it says it's their most important. I think it's top three or four. Okay. But it's been top three or four for a long time. Yes. Right? That chart you showed with the budget and how we've been underspending. What has been the, I'm curious more on the reasoning why we have been underspending in the past five, it looks like seven years worth of, I'm not sure if anyone on council may know why, but because it's not prioritized as a core service. I mean, it wasn't in, that's why I particularly tried to push for um, roads in particular, because we've gotten this presentation a couple times, um, probably since I've been on council, I'm sure you've gotten way more. Um, and it's always been brought up that we need to fund it, we need to fund it, but it's never been prioritized in a strategic plan. Except this year, what? Except this year, so. The first time. This was the first year since mm -hmm. since I've been on. But before, I think that it was. But um, I don't know about the three years in between when you were gone and I wasn't on. Bruce was here at that time. He might be able to say, but um, I'm certainly glad to see that it's on our strategic plan now. There, there has been. I mean, I, I, there's certainly been an effort to devote whatever available funds are. The, the problem with streets and, and a lot of things is 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 i'm competing against fire department police department parks and recreation i mean everybody everybody has their needs and I, i'm not here to tell you that our needs is are greater than anyone else's but there certainly is a need is what i would say but and and this is for this side of the table <laughs> that's up for us to say and i mean that's always been the problem like for me i'm 
certainly not shy about saying I'm a core services person and that's all the things that you see at the top of the survey, water, police, fire, and streets, these are the things that people expect us to do well. So, but I'm, that's why I think that we, we have a lot of value, again, that we, we did it in our strategic plan, making sure we're prioritizing those, those things that the survey said were important. Start the budget there and then go. You know what's left. They're at the top of the funnel. Okay. One last question, sorry. Yep. If you had a wish list budget number for 23, what would it be? You know, I, I would like to see a, a start at about $11 million um, dollars per year. Um, and again, that, that's a hard to commit to. I understand that uh, when we're starting at six, six and a half, seven million, that's a lot, that's a big ask. I understand that. But with $11 million and a, a consistent commitment that that's what we're going to get for, you know, two, three, four years, we can really dial in our programs we can make a concerted effort to, okay, here's what we're going to do. You know, it, it's difficult to plan when, especially when inflation happens and, and, and all the cost increases have occurred this year, it makes it very difficult to plan beyond one year. We, we would like to plan five, six, seven years out uh, with a firm, you know, 10, 11, $12 million uh, number in there. May, may I add to Kurt's response? Um, Kurt and his team have been extremely accurate over the years in terms of predicting what's happening to the uh, pavement quality index, extremely accurate and tying it to our funding levels. And we will have would have wanted $10 million a year five years ago. And that PQI graph would look very different than it does today. Um, I can just tell you in my time here, I started at the city as public works and utilities director and have seen that PQI drop dramatically. And we are now in that, I would hazard to say we're, we're we're into that danger zone now where Kurt and the team is not able to keep up. Um, it's what Councillor Baker was asking about with, with half your questions. Um, we're past crack ceiling on almost all the streets now, which is really sad because we haven't been able to preserve and lock in that value of those expensive uh, rehabs. And so we're now into that that cascade where, um, where we, we're not able to do it. But there's also a realistic limit. Um, you know, I don't think we could. I don't think we could give you 15 million a year and have you spend that in 23, just based on uh, the ability to produce uh, materials, uh, labor, uh, contract uh, capabilities. But uh, what, what, you know, just reiterate what Kurt said is, if we if we move up and then lock it in, so he can predict what he's going to be able to do over the next three or four years. That's there's value in that. A lot of value in that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I would also add too to that is. You know, this is not a Westminster problem. This is not even a Colorado problem. This is a this is a nationwide problem. Um, a lack of infrastructure funding is is occurring has occurred across the country. Um, and I'm I'm happy to uh, get a copy of the, the the pavement survey from the Denver metro area, and you you can see that. I mean, are we in a great condition? No, but at least we're not you know this group or, or and you'll see that. And I'll make sure I get that to you. And, and certainly, if you have follow up questions about that, I'm happy to happy to answer any that you may have. Um, for budget pur purposes as you move forward, would you like to hear what everybody has to say about increasing street budget around here? A yes or a no? It would be very helpful to get a read uh, uh, on that from, from City Council because we, we can build that into our, our all of our processes of the, the big budget, for the full budget process into our ARPA work that we're bringing back to you shortly. Um, that can really help us uh, guide us. Councilor Baker? Uh, well, I'd be more than happy to divert the $1.9 million that went into the uh, innovation or whatever was called, the entire fund into that, absolutely. And I'd be more than willing to look at several million dollars that were devoted to water conservation in the parks, in the ARPA funds, and move that to roads. I think that'd be money better spent. Yeah, I, I, I'm willing to, willing to have the discussion of more money because we elevated in our strap line. Yes. I'm a yes. 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 More money. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here so late. I'm sorry. Well, no worries. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity <laughs> to come, come in front of you this evening. It was, it was Thank you. Thank you. Sleep well. <laughs>
Be safe going home. Thank you. <laughs> Don't fall asleep. Okay, next up. Open space and fire. Okay. Sorry, Chief, we gave your money away. <laughs> Our money. Our money. <laughs> That's okay. Ninety-eight more days. <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> uh, so that'd be like five million. <laughs> okay. Ready, Mayor? I'm ready. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council and guest. Uh, I'm here along with my new friend and co coworker Tomas to spend a little bit of time with you talking about our response from an emergency response standpoint to open space fires, but then also to hopefully answer your questions regarding our maintenance practices that uh, contribute to mitigating those fires uh, in the uh, open space. Uh, some of the uh, wildland urban interface vegetation that we have, and also some of the unmaintained vegetation growth that the city owns. Um, you know, the fire department has obviously uh, been involved in the response to these types of fires for a number of years. Uh, we have, uh, and I attached it to the, to the uh, agenda memo for you, uh, standard operating guideline that really spells out sort of our overall operation um, and how we respond to this. Um, we respond to a lot of field slash open space slash vegetation fires all the time now. And um, it, it is becoming much more of a year round response. Um, fortunately for us, most of them are relatively small, uh, but but we have had some, some relatively large uh, <coughs> wind driven fires, particularly on the west and northwest end of the city. Uh, the majority of them have originated outside the city. And then obviously with the prevailing winds coming west, southwest, uh, there is that potential that they can impact under our open space. And in the past they have, uh, but we've been very fortunate up to this point that we haven't lost structures. Uh, there have been times uh, where we have residential areas bordering the uh, open space areas. And when I say open space, I'm gonna use all vegetation stuff and not pick and choose, but um, you know, we've had fences damaged and that type of thing. But um, in some instances, uh, we've done a very good job with our response. And in a few instances, we've been lucky that we didn't have the wind. We didn't have the terrain issues that some of the cities have and that sort of thing. So um, I have learned since uh, January uh, after we started putting this together and working with Tomas, uh, the extraordinarily talented people that he has on the open space team and what their true technical capabilities are and understanding fires involving vegetation and, and the, the expertise they bring that I didn't know they had. And I've been here a long time, did not know they had it. And uh, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. It makes me wonder why they don't work for the fire department. Hey, uh, I'm going after my best employees. Really, it's got to stop. That, that's all I ask our recruitment people to do is, is hire the best, hire the greatest, and we'll train them. Um, but I feel confident that uh, we have a really strong program in place. Um, I know since my time as fire chief, we've developed stronger relationships with our neighboring jurisdictions that allow us to share more readily, more resources. We're coming to each other's aid much more quickly with much more resources. Uh, and, and we have always had that collaborative, cooperative relationship and, and working with, with the open space team in terms of managing things. They have over the years uh, got into the practice uh, occasionally of, of, of utilizing prescribed burns. Uh, to manage some of that. And they've obviously worked with our people. You know, we have we have thir 13 
presently 13 personnel specifically trained for wildland fire deployment. And uh, we're going to add at least three. I know what's going on. <laughs> eight more people to that because it, it does require unique discipline. It's a different discipline in the fire world. It, it requires a different uh, sort of science to understand all of that. It integrates in a lot more stuff in terms of climate and terrain and temperature and stuff that this doesn't ordinarily need to come into play when we're dealing with the structural stuff. And uh, uh, the expertise that Tomas's team has along with the the tactical expertise that our people have, we're in we're in really good shape. Uh, and um, so I'm I'm just going to stop there for a minute and see if Tomas has anything to say. But then you know, you heard a, a great presentation earlier tonight about two, uh, two <clears throat> fires, one extraordinarily catastrophic, the other one that could be, could have been, and fortunately has not been. But we're not you know we're going to be challenged with these. Uh, and, and uh, from, from my perspective, as long as as the wind doesn't get too crazy, we'll generally be okay. You know, we'll, we'll generally be able to battle these fires and, and rain them in. So. Plus, there's a, we're, we're blessed really with this remarkable 3,776 acres uh, of open space and what I've learned is that it's primarily short, the short grass prairie. So the fuel load is lower than it would be in other kinds of landscapes, which is a good thing, but it's also a landscape designed to burn by nature. It's intended to burn. Uh, so there will be fires. Um, and I don't know if you want to click through some yeah, of the slides. We should. Let's, yeah, let's bring up the, the first slide, the second. Yeah, there you go. So there's a couple of really significant things about our open spaces that it's not contiguous. It's sort of here and there throughout the city. Uh, so it doesn't have the same kind of uh, all encompassing problem that Boulder has where they're, they're completely surrounded by um, open space, preserved and protected open space. Um, That's because they have the moat to get into the city. Yeah, <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Um, next slide, please. You know, we, uh, is, there's nothing here that you're not already familiar with. We understand what causes these fires and what exacerbates them. Certainly the wind is one of the most dramatic and, and scary things that can happen, but there's even things like the railroads, uh, it, when they're rumbling through town, they spark and can cause yep. fires too. So there's a lot. We respond on a lot of fires in their railroad right away that are caused by the the uh, steel wheels on iron rails and um, mm -hmm. iron wheels on iron rails. And and we, we there's been times we've chased fires from almost one end of the city <laughs> to the other as the train moves along. And, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot smarter about those when we get those types of fires. We see we have a system that allows units to be dispatched well in advance to get well ahead of it. And, uh, you know, occasionally uh, we see uh, neighborhood fencing scorched by these, but, you know, it's generally turned out to be okay. But yeah. we get almost zero cooperation from from the, from the railroads. They they could care less, you know. And, and early on, early, in an earlier time in my career, I was – I was going to big dog it. I tried to bill them. <laughs> At the <that> cover. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. So human caused, of course, uh, we know that that's an issue. Um, and just the other day, you guys yep. very quickly dealt with a human caused fire. And yep. It was done, taken care of uh, in minutes. It was really You know, uh, mid-June through... Mm, at least the first part of July, maybe mid-July, we we do experience a lot of fires from fireworks in the open mm -hmm. space because the kids play. But you know they're not going to do it around their parents, so they they take off, and uh, mm -hmm. you know the bottle rockets, the firecrackers, the different things set set the grasses on fire. But history historically, we've been pretty fortunate with these. Yeah. Next slide, please. Well, this was a real eye opener for me, especially um, if you look at the really scary red 
and orange on the western side of town. Uh, that's where we've got the most, uh, the highest probability of a fire. Um, so yeah, it's going to burn. And isn't burn. that where the Marshall Fire was? Um, Marshall Fire is to the west of that. Yeah, further west, north and west. Further west. north yeah. and further west. Yeah. yeah, it's not on this map. But if you look at our yeah. So the biggest uh, fire risk that we have is really uh, our West uh, Westminster Hills open space, I would say, mm -hmm. and then followed by Stanley Lake uh, Regional Park. The rest of the city is really not. Yeah, yeah. We'll high get, risk. you know, uh, around some of the the uh, vegetation around some of the water. You know, we'll get the cattails uh, occasionally. Uh, things will will spring up. Uh, along uh, different canals, but that's usually attributed to kids with campfires, maybe kids with fireworks and that type of thing. Uh, but the majority of the, the biggest fires that we've had uh, in the past uh, were primarily in two areas. One is in the area of 84th and Federal at the, uh, at the farm when before they, you know, they plow half the field now and we haven't had big fires there for a while. We used to periodically have some pretty interesting fires in their wheat fields, but it's mostly on the west western end out there are the big ones that can get to be interesting. And the majority of those fires, if I'm recalling correctly, guys, make sure that uh, I'm right in this, but it's uh, discarded cigarettes along the highways, <clears throat> people shooting because the, the, uh, the ammunition they're shooting creates the heat, you know, gets down into the to the vegetation and that type of thing. Some of it, some of it's arson, a lot of it's fireworks. You know, when you look at that area on the lower end, there's not a lot of residential out in there. There's a little bit, but we don't have the, the density that we see up with the Marshall fire and that type of thing. But will it happen someday? I don't know, you know? So we're, we're actually really lucky that there, we don't have that urban wildlands interface yeah. that is where the real highest risk is. Yeah, and that's what Boulder's dealing with up there with, with their fires, the true, while in an urban interface. Next one. Next uh, slide. Councillor Baker had a oh, question. Yeah, aren't we at risk from the Broomfield open space that runs up against the west part of a city? It'd be the orange area above our mm -hmm. purple line down there. A little bit of it, yeah. Because isn't that in the Marshall Fire, it was just the sheer volume of open space that sent so many fire brands into the neighborhood and then the wind blowing 100 right. miles an hour. Yeah, the wind blowing the fire. Really yeah, because the, it created so and many is spot there any fires. Way to, any way to mitigate that? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, and I've been told that grassland needs some kind of challenge to it. Either a burn, animals, or mowing. It's got to be challenged at least once a year. Um, and of course, yeah. burning fields on Rocky Flats isn't going to fly. Yeah, that's no, kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, there are some most. I don't know of anybody locally uh, that are our neighbors that that do that. That's that's done primarily by the state and the feds on the lands that they own, and those are prescribed burns. You know, they'll go in right. with their yeah. with their torches. Well, and they, I mean, that is really supposedly the best practice. I'm not, I don't know about that. that I would agree. That, yeah, okay, but that either mowing or animals, and we really don't have animals. So, so okay, do we have a uh, some kind of system in place where we mow our really grasses once a year? We do not. And Should there's we? no. Um, my understanding, and I can dig into this and give you more information. Um, our true deep expert is Joe Rally, and unfortunately, he's on vacation this week. Uh, otherwise, I would have had him here. But one of the problems with mowing is that, uh, especially in our more urbanized areas, is that it encourages invasive species to just explode, particularly the, the ones that become the tumbleweeds that are so flammable. And so there, it's, we're very judicious about where we mow. We do the, the perimeter mowing, and not on all of our open spaces, but we do it where it makes sense. Uh, and that's primarily to give access to, to fire. 
so that they can get in, not to fire, but to fire uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> suppression. <laughs> yeah. So if there's a need, they can easily get in and deal with the fire. Um, but it's we try not to mow the vegetation because it would cause this explosion of invasive species, which then is tends to be more uh, flammable, higher fuel load causes more of a problem. They bring the goats in. Goats can be great. I'm Metzger Farm. Metzger Farm. <laughs> we do it at Stanley Lake. Yeah. yeah we, Stanley Lake, we use goats from time to time, and it's a really, really effective way. Well, you mentioned animals. It's a great way to right. manage fuel load. So is there any way to mow it high? I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't know the answer. So is that something the city can we've talked about education and communication in our strat plan and i think a lot of the misconception is that what you just said is that prescribed burns are healthy or even mowing is healthy um, and i've always understood mowing is healthy healthy because it provides a barrier to somewhat so that it's not jumping ship and essentially wildfire wildfire um is that something education wise that the city can as we come into that season, can put out to the public of the reason why. Because I will tell you, um, my just immediate thought is um, they're not, because I grew up on 112th and Sheridan, and it was always mowed on the perimeter, always, um, up until I, I want to say 15 years ago, uh, there was no maintenance, and I considered it no maintenance. Right. So then I'm thinking the city doesn't have budget to maintain what was once mowed, but your description and your reasoning to maybe have certain areas mowed and not others, I think it would be beneficial for more residents to understand, especially long term residents that have been here, uh, because I think that will be helpful in understanding that we're battling, it, it's kind of a catch 22. Right. mowing versus invasive species, or I think it would be helpful. So the, the city's prepared a open space management plan, vegetation management plan, that really spells all this out in a lot of detail. And I think that you're absolutely right, that translating some of this more technical uh, management strategies into language that can be understood by anybody and then getting it online is a great idea. Can I... I was in here, but I want to piggyback on what you said, because this is what I what I was going to go to, is because anytime I walk the city, whether it's just I'm out and they realize who I am, that's one of the number one things that I hear about with people who live against parks. And so they've gotten different um, feedback when they've complained to the city about why aren't you mowing against my, my fence line? And um, so I'm curious about is that always the case against fence lines? Like, so I'm trying to think what that park is over off of like 88th and Dover. Because I guarantee if you go talk to those neighbors who back to that open space, you're going to get an earful about how we don't mow up to their fence line because they're concerned when the kids are out doing fireworks that, you know, it's going to end up burning their fence up. Um, and they said that they used to always do it, uh, not more recent than 15 years ago. And uh, this particular guy, has complained to the city multiple times. And I even actually remember emailing in about it. Um, and I don't I don't recall ever hearing that it was necessarily an invasive species that why they weren't doing it. Um, I don't remember what the what the reason we were given was the last time it came up, but I think you make a great point that it, we should be educating, but I hearing this, I feel like I'm not, I don't even understand fully where you are going to do that and where you're not going to do that so that when when we're out and somebody says hey you know why the hell is the city doing this that i have the proper answer to give them so i can do you know my part to educate them i, I would love to come back uh with a more uh, in-depth study session about our open space management and why we do what we do where we do and bring uh people like joe real to to share with you that information i think it's I think it's fascinating for one thing, you know, we've got this incredible asset and it's a forever landscape that this city has set aside for future generations. So it'd be great to take some time together to really understand why we do what we do, where we do, because it's all very, very thought out. And well, and then carefully. even when I was doing my research about camping and, and the homeless stuff today, it's, it 
it really all starts going like this because it talked about the fragileness of the land and exactly what you're talking about of why we don't have camping and why we don't allow people on the land except to walk the trail and why it was closing at dusk till dawn and it was it was fascinating i spent the whole afternoon just finding things and reading it because it was very fascinating well, i'd love to have a conversation about prairie dogs <laughs> because they're cute and some people love them but boy they just wreck the landscape and so we have to decide what do we what do we value do we value the mold the um, uh, diversity of plants that I'm a plants guy so I, I'm all about the plants do we biodiversity is really important do we value that or do we value these cute little critters that used to have a lot more space and they've been concentrated into the little bit of space that's left that was my only death threat on the last council <laughs> What the killing the the yeah managing we, the uh, we managed them out of uh, out of one of the parks that they were absolutely wrecking. Somebody came in and put little white crosses in each of the holes, oh. <laughs> and it, it got and and I got a letter yeah. that very succinctly said how they hoped I would die, and all I cared about because we face the green belt to behind the ice rink. Yeah. All I cared about was they were going to come after and kill my dogs. Oh. And um, so oh, anyway. that's terrible. But, you know, again, thinking so just about know this, that's a contention. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know it is. And it's out east. We have the same issue with deer. You know, people love them or they don't. But so the idea we're responsible with the, for this forever landscape that we are trying to preserve for future generations and really understanding why we do what we're doing, I think would be really a valuable conversation. Well, and I, I think for me, the, the part, and this is where when the marsh fire happened, you know, we, I think several of us were like, we want to talk about this. Because if you looked at the way that it spread, it went through their, you know, through their uh, green belts and stuff. And so I've heard a lot of concern in the community about how susceptible we are to that and what we're doing to prevent it so that that's uh, a great image to share yeah. but, the, but these additional things that the parks does just in general that you guys have been discussing Next would be would be good education for the public to understand the things that we've always done or that the parks department has always done to you know or even just in planning how you lay it out how that helped mitigate these kind of risks sure well and if we can't mitigate it we need to tell the public that too oh, yeah Next slide, please Oh yeah, just uh, jumping in on the mowing too, because that is my neighborhood and many clients along Sims. So I, my phone was ringing off the hook as well and continues to is that um, our area um, backing up to Big Dry Creek, um, north of, or west of Lucas had been mowed consistently. And it hasn't been just in the last couple of years. And I think some of that staffing also so the HOA is, has uh, sent me emails saying, you know what, we understand staffing issues, there's budget issues. If we as an HOA would be willing to take on that single cut to make everybody feel more comfortable on the back there, would the city allow us to do that with the right contractor with the right insurance? So, you know, that's a, that's a question that, that needs to be discussed on that too. Um, many of the neighbors along there take that into their own stead. You know, you have the, you, you need to protect your own property. You need to make sure it's cleared back away from right off your fence, just from a safety standpoint. But, you know, it's, it is an issue because some of them now understand the invasive species when they have a wall of tumbleweeds. Oh, yes. So, sure. you know, balancing that, but. But is that is that cut of what eight feet maybe the one that our one tractor sets out? That's not going to make a difference on that invasive part, but it'll clear away from those fences that are also more fuel. And the Marshall Fire wouldn't matter; those things were going down because the fuel was coming. You know, it's, the fire was jumping from a mile away. But will that? Would they be allowed to take that? You know, on as their own cost. So you know, I think that. It's important to understand what is the management strategy for that landscape and why it's mowed and when it's mowed and uh, before making a decision like that. The, uh, you know, the open space fuel breaks, one of the important ones that we, that we provide the city is these mowed strips 
along the fence lines. Uh, but there's a lot of other um, fuel breaks throughout the city that we benefit from. Uh, the paved pathways that we have that go through so many of our open spaces, that's a fuel break. And we, it's not just the 10 foot concrete path, but we also mow on each side. So it's a, it's a fairly wide break in the fuel. Um, there's streets there because our open space isn't contiguous. It's broken up by all of the different streets and uh, properties that um, it's just not the same scenario as as these other, um, especially Marshall. It's a completely mm -hmm. different scenario than they had up there. Thank God. So um, I don't know. Tomas, yes. that, that map you had, the previous one with the red, is that risk of initiation of fire or risk of even if it starts, the rest of the city is fine? It, it's actually speaks to the intensity of the fire uh, or the not the intensity, but the probability of a fire happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, where so, the, so the, the redder it is, the more likely we are to have a fire in those areas. So do we know risk of once it's so once that area does catch fire? So let's say Marshall fires came down this way and it kicked off and the winds were 150, et cetera. What's the risk of the rest of the city? What would have been the risk of, the, of that spreading? Are these fuel breaks? Are you saying that we're not at risk if there's a big fire that is spreading? It will actually just stop just geographically? Or no, the, no. the risk changes all the dynamics. Mm -hmm. We we get a fire that that's out on the western end that is 50 miles an hour or higher. We're in trouble. We, we potentially will see firebrands moving into to neighborhoods and then. You know, it depends on what the fuel level is, the fuel loading is in, in people's backyards and, and along the the, uh, the natural grassways that, that, you know. So, yeah, it would definitely be a concern. The the issue that, as I understand it from Marshall, is that once it became a house-to-house -house fire, yeah, there was just no stopping it because there's so much fuel in and around those homes. The fences especially yeah. just were like a, a a real high risk part of it. Well, you had, uh, you know, hundreds of propane tanks that, you know, cars, well, the fuel loading was just, just tremendous, you know, and then you have the fire that's 75, 80, 90 miles an hour and higher, just, just driving it and pushing it, so. And all of the houses. 15 feet apart. Yeah, absolutely right. Barbara's ready to move on. So okay. next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I just hope we do your program justice. So this slide details several uh, mitigation options and or projects. And um, obviously it involves a lot more decisions, a lot more fact finding, but you know, we, we you know, the open space people have a fuels reduction effort, as Tomas talked about, they have a plan. Uh, not, a people, not a lot of people know about it, and, and very few people can really understand it from the, from the technical side of things. We talk about uh, evaluating the exposed residential uh, fence lines. We talk about the opportunity to broaden and improve uh, the, the, the vegetation along Indiana and Sims, the, the fuel breaks. Uh, we do a pretty good job with the pre-planning. Jeffco uh, does a really good job with, with their open space areas, and, and we have people involved in those discussions. The, the Broomfield <laughs> people are, are doing that. Adams County does that. They have plans in place, and we participate in that pre-planning and, and uh, the discussions about, you know, what will happen with what. Uh, the the uh, enforcement of, fuel, of fuels management in the underdeveloped private land, in my mind, from a, a fire code enforcement standpoint, the operative word there is private. So, you know, it's just, uh, and then, you know, there, there's the option to consider, you know, additional water supply. But again, that's gonna involve a lot more understanding of, okay, where's the water come from? Is the water readily available? Uh, when we look at this, now up to this point, uh, with those wildland fires, we haven't had significant water issues. So it's a, 
it's you know not not necessarily a high priority, but something to consider, a potential mitigation option. Next slide, please. So we continue. There's a program that the National Fire Protection Association pushes, primarily focused on communities that have a wildland urban interface issue. Uh, we 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 hear you about communicating more with the public. The FireWise program does have a lot of good material that can be used for for uh, residential areas that are along these these open space areas. Uh, but certainly, any any public awareness and the understanding of red flag warnings those happen a lot. Uh, the Jeffco Sheriff issues those multiple times a year. The Adams County Sheriff issues those. Those get commuted upstairs to dispatch, but th there's no real definitive way uh, to notify the public of this. Um, and I think we're moving forward with some different notification systems and we're looking at different things and learning from Marshall and 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 learning from the, uh, the Boulder fire that will help us, you know, ask the right questions for the right reasons. Um, public notifications of limited access neighborhoods. This is, you know, the, the neighborhoods out there at Skystone, they're limited access. They're designed that way. And so, you know, part of that is that public notification and education process that says, are you ready to go? Do you know where your important papers are, your important things? And if you were given notification to evacuate in 30 minutes, are you prepared to do that? What if it was 15 minutes if we had the extraordinarily high winds and we had to make some real immediate notifications. And, and again, uh, the city with our 91 communications is looking at the lookout alert notification system, which is a system associated with RAVE, but th those are opt-in systems. And so getting citizens to opt in, uh, making sure I just renewed my, my uh, uh, notification in, in my system to make sure it was current and up to date. But, um, how often do, do people change houses, change phone numbers, change service providers? And service providers are the big glitch with a lot of this stuff and how compatible different systems are, and especially in that wireless notification world. And I think the last slide is just the slide that says we can entertain questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Councilor Emmons and then. Uh, city just recently passed the extension of the post tax. So I, in the, if and when you bring back the recreational maintenance, I'd like to understand and prep for our budgeting. I'd like to understand how that tax fits in what we're planning to do um, for maintenance. And if this even plays into fire mitigation. Obviously, that's a council decision. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, on the opt in notification systems, are we, when we do the, I don't remember if we're doing it quarterly now, the paper that goes out to every house, um, we make sure that those are in whenever we send that out, because I feel like that would be worth constant reminder that that's something people should do, especially with as many turnovers as we have from house to house. Residents, people move forward. I think that the uh, the public awareness and the the acceptance of the information and education they need to have, I think, is prime right now. And I think we need to be doing it pretty quickly. Uh, we've had the discussion with the dispatch people, and and uh, I know uh, Laura Mitchell and her staff has been in touch with. Our communication staff to you know we're going to put together this program and it's one of those things where we have to keep sending this notification stuff out there because it's it's more so uh it, it's even it's as important for even even other types of potential disasters within the community whether they be snow disasters whether it be chemical disasters you know and and being able to to notify the people and i know that the media has has sort of played the over notification trump card. Really? How bad would it be if we under notified? You know, I, I don't I think it's sort of like fire resources. It drives me crazy, and these two guys back here know it does, when I see a lot of units go on something that I'm assuming 
that sounds like a pretty routine call. Why are so many of these going? But I don't know all the facts. They know more about what's going on in that realm than I do because they're hearing it directly from dispatch. I'm not. I'm just looking at a, an active 911 posting thing. Um, but getting that notification stuff out there, keeping those citizens involved. And I'll be selfish and ask you guys to help us. You're, you're, you're kicking off these public meetings. You know, force that question from some of them. And, you know, we're, we're there to help them. You know, we'll, well give them the information they need to have, and hopefully they, they choose wisely. Yeah, and I think the other piece of it that we need to push out better, the part you talked about earlier, is people being prepared to leave. Because, I mean, that helps our people if they're not having to chase around, figure out what's important. They, I mean, people sh should realize, yeah. especially this day and age, after the last couple of years we've had, you should be able to leave your house in a given notice. And I know the state has a really good page that you can go through, and it just tells you, Think of these things. I know that our academies will do that, or at least your stuff. I don't remember the police talk about go backs, but um, I think that's another thing that it makes sense for any time we do communications. I yeah. try to capitalize. Time for you to go home. We have one more okay. to go. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you need anything, if you hear from residents, we're here to yeah. go. <laughs> I hope you feel like you enjoyed, you uh, earned that award tonight back there, Mr. Burke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Really Before appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Award <laughs> Tuesday <laughs> <of> tomorrow. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, sir. Mm. Let me drop that on. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, I must have talk. Oh, you ready to pull it up? So I'm just waiting for the AV guy to transfer this apparatus to the PowerPoint and then we can get started. We're going to wrap up the public session and then we'll transfer it into the exec and then we'll turn it off okay. and we'll get the cameras going. We'll get everything going. Thank you. It's 11.36 and we're out of public session. Do you want to turn off the cameras? Yeah, I put it on mute so we can turn off the stream real quick. I'll turn, turn off that. You're, you're back on though. If you can hit mute again, please.